Comes a mix This is a
horizontal position, the aorta runs in the midline. It lies on the hard skeletal structure of the virtual column. In order to switch off the flow of blood to the uterus, we need to apply pressure on the aorta from the abdominal side and compress the aorta between a closed fist and the vertebral column. Before making any compression, we must also be aware of the anatomical features near the abdominal aorta. For example, if we compress too far up, it can be painful because we might be pressing the liver edge. If we press too far down, it will not cut off the blood flow. We should also keep in mind the position of the uterus. Fortunately, the position of the umbilicus roughly corresponds to the part of the body where the aorta bifurcates and where you need to make the compression. The first step in this procedure is to localize the femoral artery in the right groin. Using your right hand, put three to four fingers in a horizontal position and firmly put pressure on the femoral artery in the right groin. Make sure that you can clearly feel the pulsations there. You must do this to monitor blood flow to the lower parts of the body during the compression. After confirming the pulsation with the right hand in the groin area, close your left hand into a fist. Make sure that the thumb is outside and not inside in order to create a plain surface which will create a good area for compression. And then, very slowly, at the level of the umbilicus, press your closed fist down until you clearly feel the pulsations of the abdominal aorta. If you do not feel the pulse of the abdominal aorta, Move your closed fist slightly to the right or left until you locate it. Then push your closed fist further down, compressing the abdominal aorta between the fist and the anterior wall of the vertebral column. If the compression is successful, the right hand will feel the femoral artery pulse disappear. Once the femoral pulse is gone, it means blood is no longer being delivered to the lower parts of the body including the uterus. This will result in reduced blood loss. If your hands become tired, it is simple to switch the hands by moving to the other side of the patient. After confirming that the compression was successful, continue to apply pressure in the same location and make sure to constantly monitor the femoral pulse. There is nothing dangerous about this technique since there is substantial collateral circulation in the pelvic area, there will be no risk of reducing blood flow to other pelvic organs while continuing abdominal aorta compression for hours, even during transport to an emergency obstetric care center, if need be. For this technique, it is important to keep in mind that the compression of the abdominal aorta in a postpartum patient is much easier than on a volunteer. This is because, one, since the woman has just delivered, the abdominal wall does not offer any muscular resistance to a compressing fist. Two, due to shock, the woman might even be semi-conscious or drowsy. And three, a woman who has just delivered and whose uterus is bleeding uncontrollably will be in hypovolemic shock and her arterial blood pressure in the aorta will be much lower than normal. This allows the compression of the abdominal aorta to be performed more easily. Let us now review the steps for this technique. 1. Localize and feel the pulsations of the femoral artery in the right groin. 2. Compress the aorta at the level of the umbilicus between a closed fist and the vertebral column. 3. Confirm the disappearance of the femoral pulse in the right groin. 
4. Continue to apply pressure and continue to monitor the femoral artery. Always keep in mind that the compression has not solved any other problems related to or causing postpartum hemorrhage. It has only reduced blood loss. In this film, we will firstly explain how to reduce the need for manual removal of placenta and then, if these precautions fail, how to safely perform the manual removal of a placenta. Anemia or weak blood happens. Medical Aid Films has previously produced a training film which explains what you can do to prevent, recognize and treat postpartum hemorrhage. You are advised to watch that film before this one. Manual removal of the placenta is a procedure that is performed when a woman has a retained placenta. A retained placenta is when the woman does not spontaneously deliver her placenta within 30 minutes of a vaginal delivery. If she is stable and not bleeding heavily, the midwife can wait up to one hour before attempting manual removal of placenta. If she is bleeding heavily after the birth and the placenta is not out, manual removal of placenta should be performed immediately. When the placenta is retained, it means the uterus cannot contract down and can lead to a postpartum hemorrhage, a serious and potentially life threatening complication. We now understand that a placenta should be delivered spontaneously within 30 minutes of delivery and that complications can occur if this does not happen. Now it's time to find out how to help the woman deliver the placenta. During labour and in the 30 minutes after delivery, you should encourage the woman to empty her own bladder to assist the spontaneous delivery of the placenta. A catheter should only be used if the woman is unable to pass urine herself. You should then try to get the woman to spontaneously deliver the placenta. If you pull on the cord, you must remember to protect the fundus to help prevent uterine inversion. If you pull too hard, the cord will tear away from the placenta. If the cord has already been pulled off, the placenta can still deliver spontaneously and so, manual removal of placenta should not be performed until one hour after the delivery of the baby, unless the woman is bleeding heavily. So if there is increased blood loss or concern about the woman's condition, then the attempts to deliver spontaneously have failed and you will need to perform a manual removal of placenta. You should be aware that there is a risk of hemorrhage, sepsis and all the rare uterine perforation and uterine inversion associated with manual removal of placenta. By following these steps, you can help to reduce the risks and lead to better outcomes for women and their babies. Now it's time to go over to our health professional to find out more. Manual removal placenta should be done in a facility prepared to treat hemorrhage and to give intravenous infusion or medication. If the woman is not bleeding, then you might have time to transfer her to a better equipped facility. To reduce the risk of shock, you should ensure you are prepared to manage increased blood loss and hemorrhage. An IV line should be in place as necessary precaution in case fluids, blood or IV drugs are needed to treat shock as a result of blood loss. Especially as the actual procedure might also be accompanied by a further hemorrhage. Remember the woman and the people supporting her 
may be frightened or distressed and so you should provide emotional support, explanation and encouragement. This procedure is painful and so before beginning I advise the woman that analgesia or general anaesthetic will be necessary for pain relief. Make sure you manage the pain adequately. Preferably, you should either give spinal anesthesia. If this is available to you, and if it can be administered quickly and safely, or IV ketamine slowly as a dose of one milligram to two milligrams per kilogram, which in adult patient is 50 to 100 milligrams. You must also manage the risk of infection and sepsis, which are associated with this procedure. <coughs> you do this by ensuring that infection precautions are adhered to and giving prophylactic intravenous antibiotics, starting at the same time as inducing anesthesia. Give a single IV dose of antibiotics before starting the procedure using either ampicillin 2 grams IV plus metronidazole. 500 milligrams IV or use cover solid 1 gram IV plus metronidazole 500 milligrams IV if the former is not available. The infection risk associated with retained placenta is high even after the placenta is removed so you should give a 5 day course of prophylactic and oral antibiotics and bacillin 500 milligrams three times a day and metronidazole 400 milligrams three times a day thereafter. If there is already clinical evidence of infection such as abdominal pain, offensive lochia which means a bad smell from the vagina, increased temperature or in some cases rigorous and sepsis is likely. Sepsis can be life-threatening so depending on what drugs are available it starts with one dose of IV gentamicin, 160 milligrams start plus ampicillin, one gram, three times a day, IV or oral, and metronidazole, 400 milligrams, three times a day, IV or oral, or use phylloxacillin, one gram, four times a day, IV or oral, preferably IV for the first 48 hours and then orally for a further three days. Oral clindamycin 450 milligrams four times a day is preferable to ampicillin and phylloxacillin if it's available. <coughs> the woman is now ready for the procedure and the health workers need to prepare themselves. Post procedure infection can be life threatening and so the need for sterility and the use of aseptic techniques is very important. The health professionals' hands and forearms need to be carefully washed and the woman's falfa should be cleansed and draped. Before beginning the manual removal placenta procedure, Please make one last check to determine that the placenta has not <coughs> moved down into the vagina and can be simply removed without manual removal of placenta. After anesthetizing, cleansing and shaking the woman, you are now ready to begin the procedure. If the umbilical cord is still attached, then hold it with one hand and pull the cord gently until it's taut and parallel with the floor, wearing high level disinfected or sterilized gloves, use long gloves if available. Insert the other hand into the vagina and up into the uterus. If the cervix has closed down, then gentle continuous pressure must be applied to the cervix with the fingers of your cupped hand until it responds and dilates. Follow the cord to reach the placenta unless the cord is already detached prior to the procedure. In this case, insert your hand gently up into the uterus and feel for the edge of the placenta. Having located the placenta, let go of the cord and move that hand up over the abdomen to the fundus of the uterus to provide pressure to bring the fundus down onto the hand inside the uterus. Detach the placenta from the implantation site by keeping the fingers tightly together and using the edge of the hand to gently and gradually make a space between the placenta and the uterine wall 
leafing, get off. Do not open your fingers wide and claw at the placenta or the wall of the uterus. Proceed slowly all around the placenta bed until the whole placenta is detached from the uterine wall. Try to only bring your hands out of the uterus when the placenta has been freed and is now in your hands. Bringing your hand out and reinserting it greatly increases the risk of introducing infection. If the placenta does not separate from the uterine surface by gentle lateral movement of the fingertips at the line of the cleavage, remove placental fragments. If the tissue is very adherent, suspect placenta agrita and refer the woman for consideration for laparotomy and possible total hysterectomy. Once the placenta is freed and ready to be removed, hold on to it and slowly withdraw the hand from the uterus, bringing the placenta with it. At the same time, apply counter pressure superbubically with the other hand. If the placenta has not separated, this will prevent the uterus inverting or turning inside out. Explore the inside of the uterine cavity carefully to ensure that all placental tissue has been removed. Give some tosia and penny units in 500 milliliters or 20 units in 1 liter of Ringer's lactate or normal saline and run at 60 drops per minute. The placenta has now safely been removed. Ask an assistant to massage the funders of the uterus to encourage a uterine contraction. If there is a continued heavy bleeding used by manual compression and give misoprostol 800 micrograms rectally. Or consider intrauterine tamponade using a balloon catheter as for spartum hemorrhage protocol. If the placenta appears intact, you must still carefully examine to ensure that it's complete. It should either be laid on a flat surface while it's examined, looking especially around the edges, or better still, place it over the back of your cupped hands and examine it carefully. Obviously, this cannot be done if the placenta has been removed piecemeal. If any placenta lobe or tissue is missing, explore the uterine cavity to remove it. If the placenta has been removed piecemeal, it will not be possible to identify missing cotyledons in this way. As with any delivery, ensure you check the woman, repair any tears to the cervix or vagina, or repair a vasectomy to ensure that all possible sources of bleeding have been identified and managed. Now that the procedure is complete and you are sure you have completely removed the placenta, you should make sure you wash and dry your own hands and arms carefully. Monitoring the patient and post-procedure care is important. Here is what you need to do. Take care to observe the woman closely until the effect of anesthesia or sedation has worn off. Monitor her vital signs, pulse, blood pressure, respiration and temperature, all of which can indicate a sign of infection. Ensure that you record details of the procedure you have carried out in the woman's record. Palpate the uterine fundus to ensure it remains contracted every 15 minutes for the first hour and then every 30 minutes for the next four hours or until stable. Watch for any abnormal bleeding. Even if the placenta appears intact, continue infusion of IV fluids until the woman is conscious and able to drink or longer while there's any suspicion of likely further bleeding. If the woman has been in shock or lost more than two liters of blood, then transfuse as necessary. This should be done sooner if she was anemic to begin with. 
For example, if you had hemoglobin less than 5 grams, you should explain to the woman that her placenta This means there's an increased chance she will have the same complication after her next birth. So you need to recommend that she gives birth to the centre equipped to deal with manual removal of the centre and that she informs this staff of her previous complications. So now you've seen how to manage a retained placenta and how to perform a manual removal of the placenta. This information will help you to save a woman's life. We hope you've enjoyed watching. There is no greater joy than the birth of a child, and no greater tragedy than the death of a mother during childbirth. As often as 1,000 times a day, a mother dies giving birth. The leading direct cause of maternal mortality is hemorrhage. Women rapidly go into shock from hemorrhage, but they die from delays. Delays in finding transport, delays during transport, and delays waiting for definitive care in referral facilities. What can save these mothers is a low-cost, reusable, easy-to-apply first aid device, the NASG, a non-pneumatic anti-shock garment made of neoprene and Velcro. By compression, the NASG stops bleeding.
You done a good job, you know. You did all the operation. I'm only just here standing. Did I stop you, somebody? Stop, stop, stop. See, it's all the little segments. Green and it is at the bottom of this uh, too. Just hold on to that piece. Clip on the end of it, please. Okay. Feed it to me. Now you put a finger in, make sure it's all clear. There's no... <coughs> and there you go. Again. Now, right up the top here. <coughs> but that above the margin. Closer, fine. Now hold the end of the clip down. The end of the clip. Right, okay? And you go over, move the uterus over, take this one right over there. Right over that, hold the stitch, will you please? Now you look, this is the important thing to look at. It. Your hand is in the doctor's, in this, the camera way. Can you hold the stitch, you? That's it, thank you. And then you look at the insertion just at the lowest segment, yeah? Same surface marking as there. Then you put the stitch through to come full of it. Now, give me the perfect now, please. Hold the uterus over like that so I can see where it's coming to. Do you hold on to this one? Yeah. 
See, show me the camera, see, where the needle comes out. Keep the tension on that. Keep the tension on it. Will you squeeze the uterus down. Squeeze the uterus. Squeeze it down. Okay, I don't want it to move. It's warm, somebody, please. Let's keep the tension down. Take that away, please. Take that away, please. Speed. You can see where it comes to the back. It won't be a minute. Let go. Just show the back where it comes to. See that? Show the front way. Swap, swap. You see where it goes through the center? That big, that big hole there. Put it, put it, you know what it is, Call that gas, see? See where it dimples that. See? Where it dimples that, you see that? Okay, over now. Hold that for a minute, please. And look at the back, you know? See? Pull this tension. Yeah. And then it goes over now like that. So hold it, squeeze the uterus, doctor, with both hands if you can. Hold this tension. Move the uterus up the top. Right, let go. Squeeze the uterus with it. Keep the tension on there. See where I come around from here again. Same again, same place. Then we shall have introduction to this cell. We have to introduction. After we shall have the commissioner of your mind to give us the opening remarks. Then the next item will be the introduction, the topic, 
Y se pare no por su falta de la responsabilidad. Y que se pare, ¿qué pasa con el pobre? ¿Cómo se puede hacer la otra vez? Se ha dado que la presentación de la gente no va a dar un dato. O no se puede que no le dice que no se puede que no. We hardly hear you. Hear you. Yeah. 
We are not here. Can you uh, adjust your volume? I We can't. The commissioner has just told us an opportunity because of the position. So I allow him to arrest the introduction and have the commissioner's remarks. So, come on, guys. Yes, sir. Oh. Thank you so much, Dr. Arthur, and uh, and the other members uh, who are in uh, in Fort Porto now. Um, and thank you, Awogo, for organizing this important dissemination. I can see you have a full house. This is very exciting. Um, uh, this is part of the ongoing uh, activities under. Uh, the National Safe Motherhood uh, Subcommittee. And I think if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, probably the fourth dissemination we are having. We have been to Mbarara, we have been to West Nile, and now Fort Porto, I think Gulu also. So we are really happy that you've been able to mobilize uh, the key stakeholders to attend this important meeting. As we shall hear from uh, the background to this, uh, we are addressing one of the biggest or the number one uh, killer of mothers in this country, not only for one year, but for the last couple of years, and that is postpartum hemorrhage. Um, you as the frontline service providers, you've been at the top of this. Uh, you've been part of the struggle to produce guidelines and intervention frameworks. And that is what we are disseminating today. We are using evidence to generate appropriate interventions that can save our mothers uh, from this very big monster. 
So as a region, I think this is very timely because equally uh, PPH remains the number one killer of our mothers and having an intervention framework disseminated uh, to guide us on how best to manage this complication is a very welcome intervention. I know uh, uh, Dr. Nonga is going to take you through a couple of, uh, of what are the suggested activities, but I think your time, your coming is commitment that you are able to improve on the practice, the industrial practice and the best practices out there. So as Minister of Health, we are excited that uh, the Fort Porto region is also having this dissemination. Um, and we are moving around the entire country with the support of AOGO and, uh, and I think uh, um, uh, um, uh, Chaving or something like that. But we are happy that uh, our partners are supporting this dissemination. And what we would request is this is a small group uh, but we know that PPH can occur at any level where there is a delivery. Uh, uh, that could be a health center too that is delivering mothers. Could even happen at the TBS home. It could happen even at the lower level health facility like a three. So we do not have all the midwives. Well, we don't have the capacity to get all those uh, um, cadres here. But we believe that when we train uh, a few of you, or when we disseminate to a few of you, this information is going to have a multiplier effect and be cascaded to the lower frontline health workers, especially our midwives. We appreciate the role that the midwives are playing and even the other uh, allied health workers. I don't know if ours are also on strike, uh, but I hope government is addressing their grievances as soon as possible. Um, we need to support our healthcare system uh, as we also put government on pressure to support us. So once again, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Minister of Health uh, to this very important uh, dissemination meeting uh, organized by AOGU and uh, uh, the Safe Motherhood Subcommittee. Dr. Sam Ononge, thank you so much uh, for being behind the forces to uh, conduct these disseminations. And your entire secretariat, I know uh, um, Susan from the Uganda Media Association and all the rest, we really appreciate your efforts and we look forward to very good deliberations. Um, I'm going in for another meeting, but I will join in shortly to listen into your deliberations. And I'm sure uh, we should be able uh, to have a very informative meeting. Dr. Arthur, thank you so much for putting the region together. And uh, I think uh, one of the Thursday morning meetings, we are going to invite Ruenzori, uh, the Thursday morning MPDSR meetings, uh, probably in the first week of, of June, to make a presentation of the maternal and child health situation and the MPDSR in Ruenzori. Otherwise, all of you, you are most welcome. And thank you so much uh, uh, for mobilizing these big numbers. Thank you so much. Meeting is officially opened. And I hand over back to you, Chair. Thank you. 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 Thank Good morning, members. Tony Toro Sekalongi is my name, and I work as KHO MCH.
So somehow we have got the conditional human. So don't waste time. Next day, the next part is going to be an important to the program of the day. Okay, again on the floor. And uh, I want to take you through the pattern of the situation we had. I think most of us have faced this, this problem during our practice. Next slide. The data we are going to look at is mostly comparing the last three years of 2020 and 2021. So, this is a condition that is preventable and much as in the pillar. However, it's the most political law mentality in the developing and the developed world. Every man that has reached birth is at risk of this condition. And those who survive will suffer severe complications. So many women who survive will suffer with severe complications. And because of where this condition occurs, the budget is grossly underestimated. The speed of accurate measurement will be very difficult. Existing measurement options. I And also, we miss out on after this information. So, what we see might be a simple one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let's look at it in the last one of the questions. The global budget lies between 5 to 5%. And uh, the prevalence of this condition, and those who believe who live between 1 liter and 500 million. Okay? The biggest part in Africa, and it is about 25.7%. Then those who believe over a liter are also high in Africa and the percentage is 5.1%. Mm -hmm. If you are really democratic, if you have the cause of maternal likewise, and you kill about the 12% of the mothers, the river. In the old country, we have this. Eight or eight percent of the money. And uh, in Africa, those people get to get who die are not three percent of Africa. Now, when they have the money of so one percent or not, the chance that to reside. So we have one in the three women have an area, however. All of the women who experience uh, and a part of them are unable. And when they are unable to have a chance of developing PPH and a 2.3% chance of dying. 
PPH is responsible for 34% of all the deaths reviewed. And I think this one is clear. When we, are, when we look, when we reflect on the maternal death reviews we have, you find most of the killers we have is what? PPH. Okay, next. So this slide reviews the leading cause of maternal death by age. You will see that PPH is killing people above 25 years. All right? Of course, there is a missing age there, which is, which is catering for a big percentage. But hemorrhage is taking a big percentage. You can see across the other side. But this slide is looking at the causes of maternal death, hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders, sepsis, abortions, and other causes. But when you look at this slide, Hemorrhage is leading. Hemorrhage is the red. Those who cannot see properly, it's the red. And the age group affected the most are those above 25 years. Okay? Although you see uh, for sepsis, it is the young ones, 20%. But PPH, which is our focus today, 42% of people who die in facilities are contributed by hemorrhage whereby PPH, which is our concern today, is taking the bigger load, 80%, and the pH, 20%. We have the hypertensive disorders and sepsis down there. We can go to the next slide. This was a review uh, showing how much PPH is killing. So this is a slide which is trying to reflect on facility levels. As I mentioned, we are looking at data of the last two years. So these are facilities in the clinics, health center two, health center three, four, hospital regional referral, and national referral. Hemorrhage in every unit is a big problem, apart from in the clinics where the, 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 the deaths are almost the same. But elsewhere, it is leading. Health center three, the percentage is up there. Health center threes and health center two, many people are dying there. Then the four, hospital referral. Now, of course, you can imagine what's happening at the national referral there. The number goes up. There might be explanations for that. My slides are ready. I want to do that part. So from this, it reflects that hemorrhage was the leading cause of death across all levels of care. And as I mentioned before, it is the leading cause in health center twos and threes. So we have to watch out in those areas. Health center fours and others, other causes are killing people. Or oh, mothers. I think I'm going to call them people. Fathers. Okay, next. So these are two situations. One is considered in case fatality rate for hemorrhage related to pregnancy. That is the mothers who die with who have got hemorrhage. Uh, you're looking at the quotas. That's the, the upper graph. Okay, and then we have the lower graph looking at the regions. And then the blue or the purple is 2020. And the orange, you know, I have, I think I have a color issue. The other color is 2021. Okay, so when you look at 2021, more people died of hemorrhage in the second quarter. Okay. And then yesterday I was talking to someone and she said that she fears to deliver in that time. She fears to deliver in that time. And then Kampala has uh, the highest death from hemorrhage, 5.8%. We go to ours, the third last. 
Okay. Last year, we had 21% and has come down. Is it 21? 2.1. 2.1. Yes. And it is now 0 0.6. I congratulate you for that. Okay. We can take some time to look at this slide. Okay. You can look at this slide and you see what's happening across the country. It's showing people who die following getting PPH. Other uh, hemorrhage in pregnancy. Okay. Can we go on? The region with the highest PPH case rate is Kampala, as I mentioned, and the one with the least is Karamoja and Toro, with 0.6%. And when you look at, go back to that slide a bit, when you look at it, if the majority of the areas we are having an increase in 2020. Doctor, please come in. Our colleagues, some of them are late. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Put the heading is not being seen. So here we are looking at other conditions which cause death in relation to PPH. PPH and APH and the first column. So when you look at the first quarter, somebody. When you look at this table, in all quarters, hemorrhage is leading in all conditions. Because they are comparing gender-based violence, sepsis, high blood pressure, abortions, malaria, and obstruction labor plus obstetric fistula. But the hemorrhage is the leader. That is the first column. It's the leader. Almost in all quarters. Now, unfortunately, in 2021, the figures seem to have gone up. Can we move on? Am I so fast? Yeah. So this, this is called, this, this slide is looking at institutional death. Okay. So January to December, 2020 and 2021. I know the graph is not so clear. I bring it a bit down. The tops. What's happening? I think that's better. So it is those people who die in the facilities, okay? 2020, the second quarter, we had the 108, and we had the 102 in 2021, around the same time. I don't know what happens. Sorry. Uh, I was trying to look at, tell you about this slide, about the deaths that occur in the institutions. And in the second quarter, that was the peak in the last 2020, and then the similar time in 2021. Now, when you look at the regions down here, looking at 20 and 21, still the colors are the same. Kampala is leading in the hospitals there. Bukedi becomes a bit better than a Toro. These are people who die in our facilities. 
You can, I think, proceed. Another slide. Are people online getting me? Yes, we are getting you clear, Doctor. Thank you. You're loud and clear now, Doctor. So let me also rest since I'm getting old. <laughs> right. So. You are joking. Okay, now, as we said that you are at higher risk of getting PPH when you're anemic, we look at anemia as well. So that slide shows us, is that the one I'm looking about? Yes, anemia and pregnancy, the percentage of pregnant women with anemia, NHB less than 10 grams on the first visit. So those people got the first visit, when we look in the first quarter, 9.8% had an HB of less than 10. And it's almost lying there. Then the last year, 7.1. So it improved. I think we are managing, we are, we are managing better. So that reflects on anemia, the, the extent of anemia we have on the first visit. And then we look at those ones who get the opportunity to have the HB what? Measured. That's the lowest level. It's not clear there. However, we have the highest number of 23.5% in Karamoja region. Those who get an opportunity to have their HB taken. It can take some time to look at that slide. Toro region, Toro region, uh, last, in 2020, we had uh, 7.8, and we have gone down to 4.1. We are unable to take HBs of people on their, on their first antenatal visit. The other region is your region, all of you are coming from, stretching from Tegebo to Kasese. Okay? Okay. So the percentage of women who are tested for anemia using the HB, I think you can see other ways of getting anemia, but the percentage on the first visit, we have almost 24% in the last part of the year. Toro region is there. Toro region is there. 2020, 25.7%. And then last year, 39.1%. Those who we managed to do what? The test. We need to improve that figure. So the national is at 23, and the total you are at how many? 30 what? 39.1. So we are above the national level. We should beat Bukedi and Karamoja, but Karamoja, we have beaten it in many other ways. The lowest was the TESO, okay? Of course, the challenge is testing. So I think NMS there is, they want to solve the problem. I understand the ministry is working hard to make sure we test it during the first visit of AMC. Okay. 
that slide addresses, addresses the percentage of pregnant women tested for anemia at first visit. I'd made a comment on that. Then, this one I've finished. Now, this one shows the extent of anemia according to region. You can't see properly that part, but I can summarize for them. Okay, that slide shows the extent of anemia according to regions, 2020. Those tested for anemia using the HB, Bukedi, West Nile had 32,460 and 70. And uh, nationally, we had 328,182. Those tested for HB. And those were anemic, were 29,808, which was 9.2%. So the people were found, whom we managed to test and found anemic were 9.2%. Let's go to our region. Those we tested were 36,441. The anemic ones were 2,858, 2, which gave 7.8 percent. Those were anemic. Then the last year, we managed to test 55, 550,000, yeah, 55,506. So we managed to test many more. And 4.1% were found to be anemic compared to 7.8. I think we did well in management. And proceed to the next one. So we're about to end our presentation on this. So the prevalence of cesarean section. What is the prevalence of CS in, in, in Buhinga? the main referral hospital. Yeah. Oh, this is a national one that every person whom we deliver and every hundred mothers we deliver, 12 are delivered by civilian section. Maternal mortality after civilian section is 50 to 100 times. In the low income settings than the developed world. Now, meaning that our, most of our mothers are at high risk of being what? Of dying when they deliver by by civilian section. I think this one is evidenced in your workplaces as well. 54% of maternal deaths were due to cesarean sections. That was when six health facilities were reviewed. And 60%, 67% of the maternal deaths were due to PPH. Let's look at, please check on the next slide. Let's look at blood because we cannot fail to talk about blood when we talk about, when we talk about PPH prevention. Can go to the next slide. This slide looks at days of blood products stock out in a year by regions. Uh, you look at South Central in 2021 had the highest stock out. Let me very first go to our area. I think Dr. Bahis' work is evidenced here. Okay. Karamoja has reasons why it's beating us in that, but you can see we are not performing badly. We need to improve, but we are not performing badly. Okay. We had very, uh, compared to others, we had less out uh, stock outs in 
2020 and 2021. Go to the next slide. So we, we need to, to, to help the blood bank to sustain this. So stockouts by health facilities. Here, they considered from four up to national referral hospitals. The health center fours have the highest stockout times. Okay. Although sometimes in this health center fours, the person to transfuse just misses, isn't it? They don't transfuse because somebody who is supposed to give some service is missing in the chain. However, the stockouts are mostly, are mostly observed in the health center fours. All health facility levels and managing authorities experience stockouts. You can see nobody, no, everybody experienced that. And the government health facilities experience the greatest stockouts, evidenced by the health center fours, which are government owned. Can I proceed? So these are challenges. What are the challenges in management of PPH? Delays in detecting PPH. You realize that if you don't detect PPH in time, you're likely to lose a person. Okay? So it's a challenge to anticipate and to detect it. And time of action matters. The moment you detect it, you have little time to act. So the moment you delay, you're likely to get a very worse outcome. Equipment, supplies, and medicines. If you fail to take a blood pressure, you might not know something is going wrong. OK? Plus. Well, supplies, lack of supplies is a challenge. And I think it's now becoming worse. The previous slide has shown us shortages, but I congratulate our, our, our region. I don't know, is it because Dr. Rahiz is, is here? I don't know, but somewhere on shortages we are doing well. But countrywide, it is a challenge. Skills to implement recommended guidelines. We shall look at this in depth on the skills. But many times we lack skills to address the problem, even when we are able to diagnose it. Lack of infrastructure to support the interventions. There are some places which have no places to store the blood, and they have to go elsewhere to get the blood. Lack of following guidelines and the guidelines not being updated. I think this is my last slide. Okay, I'm coming to an end. I think in this introduction, it is reflected that the burden of hemorrhage is high. As I had mentioned before, we fail to capture some of the people who get complications from this, type, this condition. Impact on maternal outcomes is very high. Let me not mention that one, but I could say we must act always, okay? And it is the time that we should prevent deaths from PPH. Thank you very much. I look forward at the end of today, to have, an, to have an impact on PPH in our region. Thank you very much. So I hope you are putting down your questions, which we shall address at the end. Online, am I with them? Those who can. So those who are online, you can type your questions. We shall capture them. So I request we move on.
So according to the program we are doing well, I suppose. Now, next we're going to, we're meant to have uh, the obstetric implementation framework, but we shall first have the presentation, which was meant to be after break, which is PPH guidelines and prevention. So we are going to have my teacher, my mentor, Dr. Jolie Beyeza, to present this presentation. Dr. Beyeza, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you. You people have nothing to do. Ah, uh, bring, bring, chop, bring. Yeah, that one. Uh -uh, here. I want to talk to the Put that. I want to take off the mask. Do you see what I do? Hello, hello. It's not talking. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. So, <laughs> uh, you you'd have to deal with the issue of that brown bar. Sometimes you won't be able to see the, the words, but we'll try to read them for you because this is critical and I really feel sorry that we missed some of your figures which were in the bar. Hopefully we'll share the, the slides. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, you want to stand and jump? Ko? You are okay? Those who are okay say aye. Ah, yeah. And those who are not okay, raise your hands. <laughs> the eyes have it. Okay, uh, I think you allow me to sit. Oh, all right, all right. People on the line, are you okay? Can we I are okay, doctor. Outside? Yes, we are okay. Find you, please. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, so uh, we'll get the framework later because the person to give it is uh, having some issues with connection, I guess. So let's look at prevention of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, we'll first do the prevention and then after break, we go to uh, the treatment. Uh, but that is not how it's done, you know, postpartum hemorrhage is very interestingly something to deal with, as Dr. Sebuko told you. So we are having midwives, we are having midwives, we are having doctors and other clinical people who deal with postpartum hemorrhage, right? Oh, good. So firstly, let's see, what is the definition? You know, women after they've delivered, they bleed, right? So don't say it's bleeding. It's excessive loss of blood from the genital tract. Uh, if it is primary, it is within the first 24 hours after childbirth. So if it is excessive, what is excessive? More than 500 mils, we usually say, or that amount that makes the woman hemodynamically unstable. Because we know if I'm anemic and I bleed 300, I may start looking like I've bled a little. Uh, for those who go to theater, I think it's not here, the blood loss goes to more than 1,000, where we say this is PPH at table. So you see the scissors, <laughs> it's going into the severe form of PPH. Severe is loss of more than 1,000 or a little. And massive PPH is a loss of more than two and a half liters. We know that globally, that is the epidemiology a bit, PPH occurs in about 10 to 11% of all births. And in Uganda, we put it at 9%. But knowing that our recording is also very interesting, there is a study that was done and they thought it was at 9% in Uganda. So what causes pH? The 
others. I don't like those big words, pathophysiology of the cause of PPH. We know the causes of PPH and we want to remember the four T's. It's an easy way to remember when you are in a, such an emergency that you have to look out for those four T's. We know that the tone of the uterus is about 70% because of PPH, of the PPH, 70% you'll find it is uterine atony. The tissue where you have retained the products, trauma where you have lacerations or rupture of the uterus, cervical tear, uterine inversion, all of those are categorized into trauma. And then thrombopathy, which deals with coagulation. Others call it coagulopathy, but you know that there is a lack of coagulation. So the uterus is one of the normal ligatures in life for physiological sutures. When it contracts, then it kind of cuts off those blood vessels that are going through the, those fibers or the fibers of the muscle. So ideally, when the uterus has expelled the baby, it should contract. And when it contracts also, actually the placenta detaches and then it comes out. So when the uterus fails to contract as in atony, what could be the issues? The uterus, which has over distended as in multiple or polyhydramnios, and sometimes big baby, the muscles are so over distended and contraction sometimes becomes a problem. After delivery, they don't contract well to cut off the, the bleeders. The uterine muscle exhaustion, you know, prolonged labor, you even see the woman is tired. Even the uterus gets tired. Or if there is rapid uh, labor, as in precipitate labor, after pushing out the baby, the uterus, the muscle becomes tired and it sleeps. I usually say the muscle uh, sleeps after it's tired. High parity. Hey, that uh, I remember my senior, <laughs> Dr. Mugasa, is he online? Used to tell women who are para 10, para, <laughs> and would tell them that you palpate your breast, and he would make them palpate. And then they would say, the more that uh, breast is becoming like a socks, even the uterus inside there. <laughs> And you would see the women nodding and looking down. And I thought he would put his message home that high parity, this uterus has, is tired a bit, uh, may make the, the uterus not contract, and then you have atony. Uh, abruptio placenta, placenta previa, the distortion by fibroids can also cause the uterus to not to contract well. And then, of course, some medications will relax the uterus. This is like general anesthesia. Those uh, the oxytocin is mainly because after induction of labor, then the labor stops. Then the uterus, which has been whipped, contract, kind of relaxes. Not that the oxytocin per se relaxes the uterus, but it's after you've stopped the induction of labor, then the uterus stops being whipped by the oxytocin and it relaxes. Mag sulfate, we know we use it to treat other conditions, but it actually relaxes the uterus. So have those um, relaxers, uh, those medications in mind when you are inducing your labor or treating those other conditions that this uterus may not contract. So make sure you do something about it after you've delivered. Trauma, precipitate labor, you tell the woman to start pushing on a semi-dilated cervix, then you get that picture across. The, utra, the cervix may tear. Uh, mistimed episiotomy, of course, big baby, and other operative techniques can cause trauma to the genital tract. Retained products. I think I saw a beautiful video earlier on where they were talking about uh, re moving the placenta, checking the, if it is complete. So complete placenta 
may lead to retain the products and the PPH. A pH where the placenta is a crater is very much adherent to the uterine muscle. The previous scars that retained blood clots or cause PPH due to retained tissue. Thrombin or lack of it, it may be a pre existing condition. You know, people who have hereditary disorders. People with liver disease, they tend to have a clotting problem because the clotting factors are made in the liver, but also the low hemoglobin does that. Therapeutic, if you have been on anticoagulants and phospholipids, if you had DVT in pregnancy and they put you on those uh, thinning, blood thinners, you are likely to get PPH due to lack of clotting. And of course, other states in pregnancy like preeclampsia, we know it causes a bit of clotting issues. IUFD, amniotic fluid embolism, they all cause. Their own. Okay. So we are done with thrombin or the lack of it. Let's say, we're, let's go to the diagnosis. I'm also off. It's getting off. So as they put me back, I had reached uh, estimating blood loss. And we all know that we underestimate the blood loss because the woman comes all you can see is maybe a cloth there but the blood in her retained jebitandi bikoi eshuka all those we know that we are not able to what to estimate it you've seen, you've got, you've seen pph some who has treated pph are we able to estimate all of the blood that soaked in that cloth so if you say about one liter, she has bled about one liter, probably it's like 1.5. If blood has filled a, a kidney ditch, and you know that is all the blood that there is, then you can say you can measure that blood. But we are usually not able to measure accurately the blood loss. I don't see my presentation. Hey, hey. It was echo. So we are waiting. We have the blood estimation sink in your mind, knowing because it affects also the treatment. Because if you underestimate the blood loss, you probably you will under treat. Next time we should have a what? A backup. Uh -huh. Estimation. So the gold standard to measure blood loss is uh, if you have receivers and you are able to measure all the soiled. Oh, <laughs> measure all the swabs, the mops, the sheets, the clothes the patient was in. And that assumes that for swabs, yes, you can measure the dry and then measure the what? The, the, way, the soiled ones. But we are not able to measure the, the sheets that she came in or the sheets she was uh, in before they became. So ideally, we should be able to measure those and then uh, minus what their weight was, and then you are able to estimate. So underestimation, as I said, results in inadequate treatment. And of course, this results in complications and, uh, 
I don't like saying death because we've been told that it kills a lot of women. So let's have that in mind that we underestimate. Sometimes the ongoing trickling, you've talked to the major gushing, but that keeps trickling can also lead to significant loss. And it may not be tolerated if the patient already had uh, anemia. But some, some people are able to tolerate it up to a certain point. It's not going. I tell you, this is what they call. So we are going to the prevention guidelines, which uh, we are disseminating today. That was the background. And uh, we would say that it starts prevention of PPH really starts from antenatal, where you detect and you treat the anemia. Uh, when we see these women in antenatal, with better ensure measure their HB, and ideally it should be more than 11 grams per deciliter. It should be measured at least before 26 weeks at first trimester, then mid trimester, and also at 32, 34 weeks, three times. First trimester, you have time to correct the anemia even second trimester, but towards the third trimester, you want to refer this woman to a CIMOC facility if the HB is less than 10 grams per deciliter. We know in Uganda, I think in Uganda, I don't know what other people say, when you go for antenatal, they actually call it a punyued dagala. And it's those tablets that bring them to you. So better measure their HB and give them their dagala. Yes. You need to do a birth plan, of course, for these women. And it's the, for those reasons that you need to see them in the first trimester. And then you are ready for those complications. Uh, this, I would say there is a second slide where you manage, you prevent anemia in lab, where you do monitor this woman. We've said prolonged labor does what? Causes uterine exhaustion and then PPH. So you want to prevent there even before you reach active management of third stage. You need to do some things. So manage labor, please. And then prepare for active management of third stage of labor. And I think we know how to do that. Give an oxytocin after delivery of the baby. We usually add on check that there is no other baby for undiagnosed twins. And then give within one minute. It may extend to three minutes by the time you check for the existence of another baby. Then do controlled cord traction, midwives, midwives, see that hand that is doing counter traction so that you don't cause inversions. We've got inversions from midwives and it's not acceptable. So do controlled cord traction, stabilizing the uterus to do counter traction. Then do you try and massage? Remember, we don't say go in to look for tears to remove the clots. You just look at the inspector to the vulva, inspect that the, the, the placenta is complete. Don't start pushing in your hands that you are looking for clots and retain the things at this stage. So what is the recommendation by WHO? You give an effective uterotonic. In Uganda, we use oxytocin first. 
I think somebody will talk of cabetosin. You can see it's in red because in some places it hasn't reached, but it has been included in our essential medicines list. So if you have it, that's an alternative. If you are not sure of your miso, of your oxytocin, there is misoprostol, there is a gometrin if the patient is not hypertensive or that fixed combination, especially those of you who are coming from non-public facilities may be having that. But give an effective, then you monitor uh, for two hours, that is two hours in labor ward because early detection of PPH is very critical to saving lives. You get it before it becomes massive. And then you treat, you resuscitate, you do all the things we are going to see after break. But if you get detect it early, then already you are doing prevention of the massive and of the death. Why do we keep the women in labor ward for at least two hours? Because PPH, the primary, usually in within two hours, it starts showing you signs that, oh, I'm here. Are we together? So if you've done the right things, you monitor blood loss, you monitor blood pressure and pulse in labor ward where you've delivered, probably within those two hours of quarterly monitoring, you will prevent or you will detect that PPH is occurring. Thank you very much. And if you have a question, we stop here for now. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. I don't know your name, but you can tell me. I'm called Kusol Isaac, uh, medical officer special grade wound would you? Uh, based on the definition you gave us, that the excessive bleeding and the, the mothers who can bleed, minimal bleeding, and they become hemodynamically unstable. So if we take this definition of excessive bleeding, may I think midwives will only wait for excessive bleeding and or any other doctor may wait for excessive bleeding, yet they may be minimal bleeding and the mother may be hypomodimically unstable. unstable. Secondly, uh, basing on this, I hope the guidance will have where we say every mother who comes to deliver, HB should be done. Because we don't know whether minimal bleeding will make this mother unstable. So if a mother walks into labor suit, we know her HB status. So that if we know that she's already having mild or moderate anemia, we can prepare in advance. Because if we based on excessive bleeding, we may not know where the mother is standing. Then thirdly, before even we see here the guidelines, I don't know how we are going to implement them in a center series because that's where the midwives are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Isaac. Dr. Isaac. Jack, <laughs> I'll give you another one. Yeah, Dr. Isaac, I put this back to make my point clear. Uh, I could see people are nodding because they were getting uh, confused about your statements. I said it is excessive bleeding in a sense that when a woman delivers, she'll be bleeding. They bleed, eh? Little, little, but they are what? Uh, what we call rocky alubra, then it becomes rocky what, rocky what? But this woman, to diagnose PPH, she's bleeding more than normal. And that is why we said 
more than 500 and you remember I put a caption that measurement is even once you think it's 500 that is pph 500 or more that's one and i said for those now that you are special grade when you are in theater then we usually go up to one liter that we we'll say this is pph we are diagnosing pph right and then we put on any amount that causes this woman's what? Hemodynamic status go down. So in other words, you, when you get this woman in labor, you had measured her pulse, right? You had measured her BP, her respiration. Now she has bled 200 mils. But her pulse has gone to 100. Her BP is going down. That is hemodynamic instability. And you won't say, but she's not yet 500. You take it as PPH. And to her, that has been too much bleeding. So your clinical acumen at admission is important. I'll go to your second. Uh, uh, second uh, point of measuring HB when they come, if you have that luxury. But the guideline is saying, take HB in the first trimester, repeat at 26 weeks, and again between 32 and 34. If you have these three, and they are all above 11 grams per deciliter. Probably this woman will come a month later to deliver when she's in good condition, has good anemia, <laughs> has good HB. But in case you get this woman who was in her center two or three and never got an HB estimation, then you should. But also your clinical acumen, don't throw it away. Oh, I sent her for HB, they didn't do it. So now use your clinical acumen, add on the HB in labor. Yeah, but uh, the luxury for prevention should be, because you want to prevent, do it in first trimester, second trimester end, and then mid third trimester. Three HBs, you will have this woman uh, on the right footing. And all those are in the essential guidelines which we are talking about, which probably you'll get a copy. Emphasis is on prevention at this stage. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Beza. I think by the end we shall be more polished on this. Any other question? Thank you so much, Dr. Jolly. Uh, mine is more of an inquiry or clarification concerning prevention, especially when we are Doing, do, dealing with active management of that stage of labor. Now, you talked of the eutherotonics, and uh, me while looking at them, I was wondering, because we are just preventing PPH, but then we have oxytocin, we have, please let's go to that slide. Yes, carbetocin, misoprostol, so I was wondering, is there a specific criteria? Maybe I said this mother is at risk of atony, so I give oxytocin. Maybe this one is having a particular risk. I use misoprostol, or you just choose whichever you like or prefer. Thank you, Dr. Logosi. Let's get a feedback on that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think let's agree that uh, 
we said, and I mentioned it, that the first line of treatment is oxytocin. That is by Uganda guidelines. It's oxywati. When you don't have it, and I know Bazungu add on that when you are not sure that you stored it well, but you should store it well. The cold chain in Uganda is in I'm told. So if you have oxytocin by Ugandan guideline, it's number one. Give oxytocin. Whether you think this girl will get PPH or not, because you cannot predict who is going to get. That's why all, or what? Eh? Mothers delivering, whether by scissor or by, or assisted, should have active management of third stage of labor. All, because you don't know whether she will. You'll be surprised. We've lost PGs in what? For P, you're having PPH. And we say, ah, oh, you know, grandma tips. And then, and then this, she gets PPH. Because we don't even check these things. other available. Whatever you have that is available, use it to do active management of third stage of labor. There was somebody online and now he has gone. Was it a joke? Hello? Yes. Somebody good. was online. Yeah, a joke, Yona. Yes, good Can morning. Unmute or somebody unmute him and he asks his question and it will be the last question. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Dr. Jody. Okay. Um, a joke you now. Ask for questions and then yes. after which we are going to go, to go for tea. <clears throat> yes, thank you so much. I'm a joke you a senior nursing officer and in charge maternity Rukuni Hospital. Um, my question is about uh, uh, the assessment for HB, HB. What I'm sure of, most of our facilities, especially health centers raise, uh, and even some health center fours, even some hospitals don't have uh, uh, laboratory investigative equipment, the HemoQ, for doing uh, uh, HB. Uh, I wonder how this, this will be implemented in order for us to detect Earlier, and we see the specific management you can give mothers who are at risk of having uh, PPH. Thank you so much. Have you heard this in UHP? Who is the name of the center for? Do you have a Do you have PHB? Have you heard? Uh, people here are very okay. Now I can't ask the regional departments and hospitals. If the center that he has. My understanding is that all the center threes and fours are of um, at least a rudimentary laboratory where HB or CPC can be done in analysis, blood sugar, all those. So, uh, Yona, we should not use that. If the labs are not equipped, that's a different issue and it should be dealt with administratively. Thank you very much. Okay. It's 11. Those online, we are going to break off. You can also break off and have your break. 
Those who are here, they are going to break off for 30 minutes. You can go downstairs and pass that door on this door. Try to keep time. It's 11, so I expect you in about 25 minutes back here. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Ameni from Fort Porto Regional Referral Hospital, my midwife. Any other person? Um, Dr. John Jones Buenje, an intern doctor of Fort Porto Regional Referral Hospital. Are we done? I'm Katusa Rosemary, Assistant Nursing Officer, Wendibigo General Super Hospital. Thank you very much. Any other person? Okay, thank you very much for that. Need the mic. <laughs> so Mugamba Atanji. Is he Hadija already? Hadija, you're going to go do, do you see I need to become the PS? <laughs> Look at how I'm looking there I'm with the yellow. yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Who? <laughs> how do you, you are yellow and you put on yellow? <laughs> Me, I put on yellow because I'm not yellow. <laughs> mm. Mm. So for her, she's yellow. So she doesn't have to put yellow. Me, I'm not yellow, so I can put yellow. Mm. Hello? Hello? Those on the line, are you with us? Are they with us? Those on line, we, we are resuming our program. Is Hadija Naka today online? Dr. Arthur, I'm online. Hadija Naka today, I'm looking for you. You're Dr. Online? Arthur, I'm online. Okay. Right, just hold on a bit, stay online. Ladies and gentlemen, we are proceeding with our presentations and we are going to have another presentation, which is uh, new commodities in PPH management, correct use, of heat stable carbetosine and renexamic acid for PPH. Now, this presentation is online by Sister Hadija Nakatude. We are going to project the slides in the presentation. Thank you very much. Hadija, yes, the Dr. time is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. The Augu team and then the NASMEC PPH subcommittee team. My name is Nakatude Hadija. I am a midwife and my midwife educator, and I am a member of the PPH National Subcommittee. So I'm going to take you through heat stable carbentosin for the prevention of PPH, a new commodity in Uganda. So next slide. So earlier on, Doctor, as Doctor Jolly was discussing, she was taking us through the different causes of PPH, and then the prevention, she talked about oxytocin being the number one drug that we have in Uganda. But I want to bring to your attention that we have a new commodity that is called heat stable carbentosin, and it is the one that I want to put much emphasis on 
But more so, I want to emphasize that heat stable carbentosin is a drug that is only and only for the prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. Stella, I'm waiting for the slides. Stella, can I share from my side? Hold on a bit. Okay. So I'm going to skip the first slides. I think there are like five slides because already as Dr. Arthur was discussing and Dr. Jolly, they were able to take us through the, 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 the PPH statistics that we have in Uganda and the different um, districts in Uganda. So I want to go straight to the heat stable carbentosin. So we realize that when a mother gets PPH, it's, it's, it brings a lot of complications to them. We have uh, things that are related to the negative physical, psychological, financial, and social consequences that are brought about by PPH. Next slide. So we also know that the major, uh, the majority of deaths from PPH are due to uterine autonomy, and they could be prevented. But the drug of choice that we have, uh, oxytocin, the current standard of care, uterotonic, requires cold chain transport and storage. And yet when we look back to our health facilities, many of us do not have the fridges, or at some point till the fridges are there, but we are not able to, con to maintain the cold chain. So what does this impose to our country? It means that however much the drug is available, we are not able to maintain the potency of the cold chain. So when you look at this graph, it shows that a study was conducted in the different countries and 22% of the health facilities only have the fridges. And then only one in, the, in four of the, of the health uh, workers, it's only one who is trained in the maintenance of cold chain. So that was, that, what, what would that mean? It meant that new solutions are urgently needed to prevent PPH in the country that face the highest burden. So the solution that we're talking about here is his stable carbentosin. And his stable carbentosin is a uterotonic, next slide, which does not need to be transported or stored at two to eight degrees Celsius. And then heat stable carbentosin can be stable for 48 months when stored below 30 degrees Celsius, but it should not be frozen. Next slide. So what is the difference between heat stable carbentosin and oxytocin? Of course, we understand that both of them are uterotonics, but here is the difference. Carbentosin is a long acting synthetic analog of oxytocin that contracts the uterus. And then according to the WHO recommendations, it supports that the use of carbentosin in the prevention of PPH for all births in contexts where its cost is comparable to other effective uterotonics, it is recommended that carbentosin is used in settings where oxytocin is unavailable or its quality cannot be guaranteed. And then also important to note that carbentosin is added on the WHO, uh, WHO model list of essential medicines. Next slide. So in the next two slides, we're going to look at the WHO recommendations. And of course, as a country, Uganda, we also get our recommendations from WHO. So the first recommendation is that is, is to effectively prevent PPH, you use oxytocin. That is the first recommendation. And then the second recommendation is the carbentosin that I am talking about. Next slide. So uh, still you can see this still shows you the WHO recommendations. 
that if you do not use that oxytocin, which is 10 international units, IMOIV, the next thing is uh, you used to use heat stable carbentosin, which is 100 micrograms, IMOIV. So heat stable carbentosin is included on the WHO essential medicines list, as I told you already. It comes as an injection, which is 100 micrograms, uh, which is equivalent to one meal. And it comes as IV and IM. Then uh, when we look at, of course, we, as doctor was discussing, we have so many different types of uterotonics on the market, but uh, the, the first uterotonic is always oxytocin. And uh, the mechanism of action, it binds at oxytocin receptors and it stimulates myometric or smooth muscle contractions. And then how about the heat stable carbentosin that we are talking about? It has the same mechanism of action as oxytocin, but the difference here is its duration of uterine activity is, is longer. Let's proceed. So what is the clinical value of heat stable carbentosin? So um, the last slide, clinical value of heat stable carbentosin. I think we skipped it, but uh, okay, heat stable carbentosin, one of the clinical values is it does not require refrigeration and can be stored up to 48 months. And then it is given as a single dose and easy to administer for the prevention of PPH. Okay, then the other slide is we want to look at the favorable safety profile of this drug. So as per the meta-analysis, heat stable carbentosin and oxytocin have the most favorable side effects. And of course, here when we are talking about the side effects, we are talking about fever, nausea, shivering, and vomiting. So heat stable carbentosin and oxytocin have a comparable safety profile. Okay, now we want to compare because we, we are looking at the drug that we have, that is oxytocin versus carbentosin. Uh, so a duration of effect for injection of heat stable carbentosin and oxytocin, you realize that when you give these two drugs at the same time, oxytocin is going to take a duration of 30 minutes and then heat stable carbentosin, given 100 micrograms IM will take a duration of 119 minutes. And that's why I say that both of them are uterotonics, but the difference is heat stable carbentosin lasts the action of duration takes longer compared to oxytocin. And that is what is in this slide. So heat stable carbentosin indication, just to emphasize, it is only and only for the prevention of uh, PPH due to uterine atony and must be administered only after delivery of the infant. And the reason there is because we said it has a long duration of action. So if you give it before delivery of the infant, we are all health workers, we know what is going to happen. So what are the contraindications of heat stable carbentosin? Number one, Heat stable carbentosin is not used for labor augmentation or induction during pregnancy and labor before the childbirth in women with serious cardiovascular disorder, disorders, in women with hepatic or renal disorders, in women with epilepsy. Then lastly, in women with hypersensitivity to carbentosin or oxytocin, we are not supposed to give heat stable carbentosin. Then the warnings, of course, this one I'd already say that when you're using it, the Boca Bentosin, please first rule out the presence of another baby, multiple gestation before administration. And then hit the Boca Bentosin is contraindicated during pregnancy, including the for induction of labor, and then never inject hit the Boca Bentosin before the birth of the infant. So the parking, when you look at this slide, I, I hope you can see that side. The parking heat stable carbentosin comes in, in this, and this is fairing, carbentosin fairing. The commercial pack contains 10 ampules. 
and uh, the PAC has a no range background to differentiate it with other uterotonic drugs. And each ampule is equivalent to one mil, which contains 100 micrograms of carbentosin. So um, uh, when it comes to administration, it is also important to know how we administer heat stable carbentosin. So it must be injected as soon as possible after birth of the infant and preferably before delivery of the placenta. But make sure that there is no multiple gestation and it must be administered by a skilled health professional. Then we come to IV injection. I told you uh, heat-stable carbentosin comes as IV and IM, but this is important for IV. For IV solution, you do not dilute it. You give it directly in the IV port. So uh, because we are used to oxytocin, there are so many times when you are using oxytocin, we put it in the IV drip, uh, in the IV um, normal saline drip. But for heat stable carbentosin IV administration, it is important that you give it directly in the IV port. Then. Um, here also important that for heat stable carbentosin, we give one dose, one patient. So this is what I was trying to explain for IV. You give it slowly. So do not inject heat stable carbentosin into the intravascular fluid bag. Then for IM, that is for IM administration, it is one mil, which is equivalent to 100 micrograms, and it is given, it is administered intramuscularly. And uh, heat stable carbentosin interactions, we said that heat stable carbentosin is only and only given for the prevention of PPH. So what happens if a woman continues to bleed after administration of heat stable carbentosin? It means that now you have gone past prevention, you're going to go into management of PPH. So that means you have to consider our local protocols as Uganda, and then you're able to manage the PPH. So the, for the storage, as I said earlier, histable carbentosin can be stored below 30 degrees Celsius, but it should not be frozen. And then the ampules must be kept in the outer carton to protect the product from light during storage. And then of course, before administration, you need to ensure that it is not an expired drug. So we look at the progress as Uganda, of course, we are talking about heat stable carbentosin, which is a new commodity. And some of you must be even wondering when we've not seen this drug and we are talking about it. But for Uganda's progress, already this drug is approved by Ministry of Health. And then it was registered by the National Drug Authority. And then the drug was included in the essential maternal and newborn care guidelines. And actually that is page 94, which is in the management of, sorry, in the prevent, in the management of third stage of labor. And then for the other plans, uh, Uganda as a country, we are looking forward to including this drug in the essential medical, the EML, that is the essential medicines list. And I think as Dr. Unonga will be talking about the obstetric hemorrhage framework, probably he'll hint something about it. And then we, we shall include this drug in the UCG and then procurement by AMCHIP. And then of course, we are trying to do capacity on correct use of the drug. So thank you so much for listening to me. I can welcome questions now. Okay, that was... Thank you, Adija, for that brief and very detailed presentation on carbetosin. Are there any questions? Adija, stay online. There seems to be a burning around, including me. Thank you, Dr. Arthur and Sister Adija. My question is, do we have two different formulation for this heat stable carbetosin? That one is for IM and the other one is for IV, or it's like uh, oxytocin, it comes in one ampule and can be used interchangeably. Thank you.
Mine also is on that on the way of administering it. I've seen, I've had, she has told us it is one ampule of a hundred milligrams. One, yeah. Now I'm wondering, is it like the normal oxytocin, which we normally have, we get one ampule break, we give, or we remove one mil from that ampule, we keep it. Any other questions? Thank you, thank you so much for the presentation. But I would love, she goes back to the contraindications. We didn't get them clearly. Thank you so much, Sister Hadija. My question is, we still have oxytocin on the market and it is working clearly during both induction prevention of pH, who is it that we are bringing in the heat stable carbentosin that is only indicated for prevention of PPH? Okay. Any more questions? All right, let's go back to that time. Thank you. I have three questions. One, in the presence of other uterotonics, like misoprostol, which we can use in prevention of primary and secondary PPH and management, if both are there, because we have compared carbetocin to oxytocin. In the presence of misoprostol, and carbetocin, what would be the drug of choice? Egometrin is a problem because of heart conditions, cardiovascular or other. Here we have a drug which we are taking too, which is contraindicated in people with cardiovascular disorders. And then we are preferring it to what? including epilepsy. So even it is contraindicated in epilepsy and other conditions. That's one. The third question is cost effectiveness. We have been using oxytocin to induce labor, to prevent PPH and PPH. Here we are with a drug which is going only to be used to prevent PPH and treat PPH. Is it a drug of choice in PPH? Thank you very much. It's used to prevent only. We cannot induce labor. We cannot prevent. We cannot treat. Thank you very much. Are you online? Yes, doctor. Is she still online? online? Yes, I'm online. Yes. Actually, have you noted those ones? Other... Yes, I have noted them. So, um, just to, um, I'm going to respond to your concerns. One was asking about the formulation of its tebocabentosin. We have one formulation that is both for IV and IM. That is 100 micrograms, which is equivalent to one mil. I had one of the, the sisters who was talking about 100 milligrams. Please, hit the Boca Bentosin comes as 100 micrograms, which is equivalent to one meal. I hope I have answered that. Um, someone was uh, talking about, asked a question about whether we are phasing out oxytocin. In my presentation, I didn't say anything like we are phasing out oxytocin. And actually, when you also look at the guidelines, mm -hmm. they clearly stipulate that the first drug of choice in the management of PPH in Uganda is oxytocin. But of course, we, are, we know it's actually there, the recommendation. First drug of choice is oxytocin. But because oxytocin has its own challenges, especially with the cold chain failure, 
that's why we are saying that in circumstances where you feel that your oxytocin is not good enough and you're not sure that you have maintained the cold chain, then the next drug of choice is carbentosin. I hope I have answered that, Dr. Arthur. So we are not phasing out oxytocin because, of course, we have the, when you look at oxytocin, it has its advantages compared to hitstabocabentosin. Hitstabocabentosin is only and only for prevention of PPH. And then oxytocin, as someone has already said, it can be used for prevention, it can be used for induction, and it can be used for augmentation. Then, um, then, um, um, I, I wanted to bring to your notice too that hits the bocabentosin also comes as uh, there's what we call PABO, P A B A L. But this one comes mm -hmm. as um, carbentosin varying. It is the one that the government of Uganda is here mm -hmm. to procure. Number one, because of its cost. Because when you compare the other one, it is almost something like $44 cents. But then this one is at a very subsidized price that we think that probably people who are in Northern region do, uh, who are facing problems with cold chain maintenance, it could be an effective solution to the prevention of PPH. So for Dr. Arthur, um, I think I've also answered your question because the question was all around why heat stable carbentosin and then oxytocin. But I, I, I still re echo and say we are not phasing away oxytocin because it is the first drug of choice that we use in the prevention. But we are bringing heat stable carbentosin due to the challenges that we face as a country. And uh, these challenges are due to cold chain failure. Uh, maybe there's an online question here. Someone was asking, when do we expect the carbentosin in, in our facilities? Um, I can push that because Dr. Jolie has been part of these discussions. Since she's physically present, she can be able to tell us when. It's the book carbentosin should be in our facilities. Thank you so much. You are on mute, I can't hear you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, seeing you are pushing so hard for a drug that is only for prevention, and we are very sure what we are preventing may, might continue, and we need to manage it. We are so much, we are pushing for that very drug. In, uh, you are giving an example in Northern Uganda, where the cold chain is not perfect. Uh, but still we need oxytocin. Don't you think uh, we shall need to bridge and stabilize the cold chain to use the drug that is used for induction, prevention, and management than pushing so hard for the drug that will be used for prevention and we fail, prevent, and we need to manage. Uh, this drug, we are saying it is contraindicated in hepatic and renal disorders or problems. And uh, now we have uh, preeclamptic mothers and eclamptic mothers who also go into labor. Shall we use carbetosin or we won't use it? We shall use oxytocin. All right, thank you Adeja for, for your response. Any more questions within the room or online? We have one here. Yeah, I'm just following up. Thank you. Um, we are seeing it is uh, uh, the new commodities in PPH, that is uh, tranexamic acid and carbitocin. And as if we've only seen one, oh, she's still continuing. Mm -hmm. um, my discussion was on heat stable carbentosin. I am sure Dr. Jolie will be able to talk about transnamic acid as the new commodity for the management of PPH. Yes, I will. Thank you, doctor. Okay. okay. Thank you, Hadija. I think we are done with the presentation concerning Hadija. 
we shall entertain more questions at our last part of the session of question and answers and answers. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Atta. Thank you very much, Hadija. Any other questions concerning the presentation will be considered at the end. I request we move on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go now on next presentation, which is treatment, including bundle care approach by Dr. Beza Jolie. Dr. Beza, it's your time. Thank you. Management, I still have that one. I'm waiting for my slides. That's the virtual data. So I'll continue with this. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, eh, eh, I think I would have to be holding like I'm drinking one third of Uganda Waraj. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want us to pay attention because the last presentation when we went for tea, I was being asked questions where you actually took time to emphasize. And then I'm asked the same question, which means there are things we are not understanding. And I want us, I would rather you stop me in the middle and then we iron out that because we reach the end and then you ask exactly something which I took time to explain. Are we together? And let's put the phones in silent and you put it upside down so that you don't keep looking at your phones. Because Dr. Sebuko told us that PPH is the major killer of women here in Uganda at least if we can't prevent it. Let's do what? I remember he emphasized all women should have active management of third stage of labor. And somebody asked me that for us, when we don't have oxytocin, we wait for the woman to bleed, and then we give mysoprostol. Is that active management of third stage? We've said all women should get what? Active management of third stage of labor. Stage two, we said oxytocin is number one. And we said that if you don't have oxytocin, then you have those other alternatives, options. We just discussed betosin at a very detailed level, but you know that even before it reaches you, you have mysoprostol, you have, no, pitocin is number one and is taking the priority, but in case you don't have, you have what? You have what? Egometrin in case the patient doesn't have hypertension. Are we together? All of those you can use for active, management of third stage of what? And we know when you do active management of third stage of labor, you prevent 70% of those who are going to get. So if you are going to get 10, you get only three whom you are going to manage. So can we go from prevention now to management? Okay, so I think this is how our new guideline looks like and with those nice goodies, the pictures. It's kind of flowery and they are using heavenly colors. 
to show you that you need to up your game in quality care. That I will not go through that, but that is essentially what we are going to talk about, about the definition. We already talked about it in the other prevention, the types, and then uh, what predisposes, and then how to diagnose and investigations. Madam and Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, PPH kills. I want to begin with that. That PPH does what? PPH kills. PPH kills in a short time. Why we have a lot of deaths from PPH? It shows that the quality of care to our mothers is lacking, is wanting. So let's go slowly, even if we live here at 6 p.m., and understand the treatment of what? Again, that is the kind of diagnosis you bleed from the birth canal after delivery up to six weeks postpartum. 500, normal delivery, or 1,000, we are revising, isn't it? Yes. Or more after C-section, or any amount that does what? The mother's condition to, to, to reiterate. Don't wait for that. Don't wait for a reduction in systolic to less than 90, CGG pulse to more than 100. Look for PPH. Be conscious of PPH. That it occurs, and once it occurs, and you don't do the right things right, and at the right time, you may lose this mother. Some of you, when you see the mother is starting to look like Kendali, you send it to Sebuko. My senior consultant here may not save that woman if she comes when she's already decompensated. Are we together? So she hasn't died at your place. She has died with him, but you kind of contributed. Types are primary, which occurs in 24 hours. After 24 hours, it becomes what? So again, we are revising what are the predisposing factors. And we say that every woman is at risk of what? Of PPH. So that's why we do active management of third stage of labor for every woman, whether Caesar, whether normal delivery. Those are the factors. You try anatomy. We've talked about the 40s, right? The causes of you try anatomy. You remember we talked about them? Retained placenta, placental fragments, prolonged labor, it is as we said, can cause the uterus to relax. Precipitate labor, you remember what we talked about. Trauma to the genital tract, either the vagina right from the introitus up to the uterus. The uterus is contracted, but the woman continues bleeding. Look for other causes other than atony. Atony is the commonest, as we know. Tissue, retained products, and then coagulation disorders. But also we know among the coagulation disorders that any of those, even atony, when you have prolonged bleeding, it consumes all the clotting, so when you come at the end or you've sent the patient to him, if the woman has already consumed all the clotting factors, he will diagnose what? Coagulopathy. It eventually comes in when the woman has bled from these other causes. But apart from that, the other causes we talked about in the first uh, presentation, but know that all these others can lead to coagulation disorders. So step by step, I hate you will see. And this protocol is in the guideline that you will get. I don't know if you are able to see or if you'll be listening to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's a bit better. Are you able to see now? 
And in this protocol, we are looking at primary postpartum hemorrhage, which occurs within blood loss of or more. And if it is cesarean, or, or, or any amount that causes hemodynamic. And how will you know hemodynamic instability? Because you are monitoring the woman, you are measuring her BP, her pulse, what other people call vitals. Yes. So you've made a diagnosis of PPH, right? First thing is you call for some places have bears. Others, you have sirens in the hospital. Others, you can shout. Help, do what? As you are calling for help, as help is coming, assess ABC. What is ABC? Airway, breathing, breathing and circulation. So, the woman is breathing, yes, good. The airway is clear, she's talking to you, even talking to her, you can't talk when your airway is not clear. And then she talks to you, she's conscious. Huh? And then you take the BPZ, all that. So your help has come. Make sure the senior most person in the team takes the lead. Are we together? So if you are a nurse, you call a nursing aid. You, yes, sometimes it's, that is the only person on the hill. So what am I saying? If you call a nursing aid, then you should be able to take the lead and give them instructions. Take the BP, take off this. Are we together? Hey, don't call somebody to come and say, uh-huh. Hmm. Hmm. And then you continue working. Take the lead if you are the senior most. If you have the luxury of being in a higher center, call somebody senior or somebody more skilled. Are we together? And when they come, you tell them where you had reached and they take over. Sometimes you call Dr. Sebuku and he's on his way to Kampala. I'm told he has some businesses in Kampala. <laughs> what do you do? Do you say, ah, and you switch off the phone? Is he able to tell you some things to do? Yes. Are we together? Don't say I go to the senior and he was going to Kampala. No. He will tell you do ABCD. Have you done ABCD? Call somebody else, eh? You know, galvanize him, maybe even the one to call you people to come for your rescue. Don't die with a PPH alone. Even if you went to the medical council, you cannot win that case. I had PPH, I had no help. Did you call? So number one, call what? As the meaning of CDC. So we say first bundle, and we bundle these Make sure that there are things you must do, which you remember. Number one, we said first killer is what? A tonic. A tonic you massage the uterine fundus. Divocytosis or mitoprostol. Or egometrin if the patient is not hypertensive. Set up two large boa. Give ringers or normal cell line. Take off blood for grouping and cross matching. This may be done by your hair who has come. As you are actually putting this large boa, take off blood before you connect. That doesn't need teaching, right? You've put in the cannula, then you put, and then you are looking for another place to, put, to, to draw blood. That means the uh, amagazimatonogakoyachi. Beginning. So you've put in the cannula, take off the blood and connects to the what? To the line and put in your ringers or normal cell line. You empty the blood. Of course, the blood is for grouping, cross matching, CBC, and uh, you get at least two units of blood. Tranexamic acid, somebody talked about it. 
maybe we'll get time to give it a detail. You give tranexamic acid, it helps with the clotting. And you give one gram IV over 10 minutes. So you see why you have two large bore needles. One is running in fluids, one you're giving those after 10 minutes, you still connect another fluid or blood, whatever uh, determination you've made. So once you've done those six, that is the initial doing. And make sure you have them here. Massage the uterus, IV. Hmm? Are we together? Have those other tip of, and know that you've done them and finished them. That's the first bundle, the first set of activities. Are we together? Then you determine the cause. At least those are running, fluids are running, bloods are taken off. Now you look for the cause. And as you get it, you treat. So we start with the placenta tissue. The first T, placenta or tissue or retained product. If the placenta is still in, you do what? You remove it, controlled contraction, or you massage the uterus, or if it is not coming out, you do manual removal, and this may be needed to go to theater, and you explore. Yeah, you may want to remove it before you go to theater, and you feel it is adherent. Don't try to push it. To force it, you may find your hand in the uterus, in the abdomen. So if you try on the ward and it's not working out, please don't force, go to theater and there you also explore for tears. If the placenta is out, of course you massage the uterus and you expel the clots. If bleeding persists, then you go the other side. You see that thing in the middle? Yes, you will put IV oxytocin because um, the placenta is out, you've expelled the clots. Maybe you want the uterus to be uh, contracted very well. You repeat tranexamic acid if bleeding is continuing after 30 minutes, or if it continues later within 24 hours. You give carboprost if needed, but most likely you don't have it, I want to dwell on it or you give um, egometrin. Let's finish that line. So they are, if these clothes have been removed, you see you are trying to make sure that the uterus remains contracted. And most times you saw the 20 IU international units in a liter you run it as an infusion slowly so that this uterus you cause it to continue contracted. Sometimes, yes, the pitocin is running, but when you touch that uterus, you're not happy of the contraction. That's when you go to the bimanual compression. You know bimanual compression? I'll bring you some pictures if you don't. And then a balloon tamponade, and I think you need uh, uh, training on how to put a balloon tamponade and shock garment, blood transfusion, referral. These are the things you consider. If the placenta is out, it was acne, and you've run the infusion, and nothing is happening. But let's go up a bit. Sebo Wange, Jangu, you come out. Hey, Sebo, where are you? Come. Where is my, my help? I want to go this side to the other T's. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. And make it big like you had make. Uh -huh. And then continue this way. Uh -huh. Yeah. A tonic uterus, if the, you see it, it went with the other one. If the uterus was a tonic, you massage the uterus, 
you expel the clothes, it will, cl it will close or it will contract and you put again, uh, you administer the pitocin so that it helps this uterus to continue contracted. If you run that 20 over like four hours, really this uterus will stay contracted. The other T are the lacerations. So you look, if there are no tissues, of course, you look for the tears or lacerations. And I know that this has come up. I know that uh, sometime, even near a tear at the introitus may lead to significant PPH if you leave it unattended to. So when you are looking for tears, start at the introitus. Was there an episiotomy? Poorly repaired and there is somebody keeping jetting out. Or there was a tear which was ignored or not seen. So tears start from the introitus and you inspect the whole genital tract up to the uterus. And of course, when you see the tear, the treatment is obvious, you repair it. If it is cervical tear or uterine rupture, you would do well to get a senior to come in. That's where uh, Dr. Sebuko and other specialists may need to be around or you refer this patient. We used to teach in PPH that if it is a cervical tear, you get a ring forceps, you see where it's bleeding, you hold it, then you roll the patient and refer when you've stopped the bleeding. Then they will sort her out when they reach, they remove your instrument, then they will repair because those tears are done in the theater. Are we together? But don't see a jetting at the cervical tear where it tore and you say, ah, you, say, you get out and you refer. She may die on the way. Get a ring forceps. You call it the movum forceps? This one with a, a, a sponge holding. Thank you very much. And you hold where it is bleeding. And you see that it has stopped. You put the patient because if she's not going to see it, that instrument won't hurt her, right? Hey, you will lay her in the whatever, roll, roll her on the trolley and carry her to the next level. They will save her because you've stopped the bleeding. Don't send a bleeding patient. Coagulopathy. That's very, a bit difficult for the lower level. If you see that blood is not clotting, you start thinking about referring to the higher level because they will need fresh frozen plasma, fresh blood. They will need it to do balloon tamponade. But if you've been trained to put it in, you do well to put it in. And then she'll come with it and they, they will decide when to remove it. And of course, we say, as we said, you repeat tranexamic acid. If after 30 minutes of giving the initial dose, the woman is still bleeding. Are we together? Uh, you know, I've finished PPH treatment there. Uh, you don't know that I've finished? What we are going to is uh, other things. This, I can't see it, but uh -huh. these are things to note the pulse, because you are measuring the pulse, the systolic pressure, when they drop by 30%, you know you are getting into trouble. Are we together? Yes. If you are not in a higher center, please send her because they might need to go in. You need to exp uh, escalate operative management and that is not done in your lower unit. Send over early enough. Don't say, I'll first do all I can. This pressure is going to come. By the time you decide to send, you may lose the woman. And of course, these you're doing those maneuvers, you need an antibiotic cover and probably broad spectrum. Ampicillin, others give keftriaxone, but also give metronidazole. Are we together? Okay. So when, of course, you send her over 
then they will do exploration in theater. They might be the B lynches, those operative maneuvers, which uh, may be out of your, out of your, next, out of your control, out of your work. So secondary PPH, the predisposing factors, there could be some retained products, there could be sepsis commonly, and then there could be some unrecognized trauma to the uterus, especially ruptured uterus or poorly repaired C-section and the, the thing gives way, the it gaps and uh, things go wrong. So this is uh, bleeding after 24 hours to six weeks. But also there may be some differentials. Don't say it's only those and I don't see them. The woman may have, I'll start with the obvious, cancer cervix. How many of your women are screened before they get pregnant? She bleeds and you think, oh, secondary PPH. Kumbe, it is what? Yeah, because within six weeks, I know some of your cultures, the massager should have done a yeah, and then the man goes in and you bleed like crazy. Yeah, others it could be gestational tropoblastic disease or rectal bleeding from hemorrhoids. Some women have hemorrhoids or the cesarean section wound gaped or even hematuria from other causes. So don't say those first three are not there. So mm, what is this? Look for other causes which may have done that. How do we treat secondary PPH? Seven one. Quickly. Yeah, you assess the condition of the patient for stability, of course. If she's hemodynamically unstable, in other words, she has bled, we still count that she has bled 500 or, or more, or any amount that makes her unstable, right? So you set up fluids, you give oxytocin or misoprostol or carboprost if you have it. So for here, let's say oxytocin or misoprostol. You give tranexamic acid. Don't forget that. One gram IV over 10 minutes. Of course, again, you do grouping, you do CBC, you cross match, and you do coagulation profile. You give blood if it is indicated. You give antibiotic because we've said one of the main causes is sepsis. If she's still unstable, you transfer to a higher center where they will look at also gestational trophoblastic disease by looking at uh, serum beta HCG. And of course, they will transfuse if uh, severely anemic. They should be able to explore the uterus and anesthesia. And if bl uh, bleeding continues, they look at the tears, the uterus, they repair. If it is poorly done, cesarean, of course, again, they repair. They have to achieve hemostasis. Sometimes they have to do laparotomy because if the C-section incision is the one that gaped, you can only repair it up. If it was a non-diagnosed ruptured uterus, you can only repair or do hysterectomy by abdominal approach. If the woman is stable, you investigate because she improves. If you give those treatments, you give antibiotics, uh, you do an ultrasound, it may be able to tell you that they are retained products. If they are not there, but she continues bleeding, you go this side of exploring and anesthesia. If the scan says, yes, they are retained products, you know how to treat retained products? 
Where is he talking with me? Online, I'm going to be un unhappy with them. So if the scan says they are retained products, uh, you do digital removal or MVA or use a sponge holding forceps or a brand curated. Don't use a sharp one. You recall what they call? Hey, where are the doctors in the, in the house? A shaman, where the walls of the uterus will get stuck to each other because you've removed the beautiful endometrium. Don't use sharp, use blunt. A digital removal, if you're able to see them and the cervix is open, sponge holding, forceps, or blunt curettage. And if bleeding continues, you go to exploration. Are we together? Are we able to greet second ray PPH? Knowing that there may be infection, retained products, or trauma. Are we together? Yes. Sebo jangwe nyambe silaba. Yeah, next. Secondary PPH also kills as much as primary PPH, but it's not as common. But if you do not, that is secondary. I need the next slide. Uh, if you don't treat it, it will still kill. So in summary, PPH, you have to have an emergency plan you have to manage it as an emergency, as absolute, absolute emergency. And I think in the guideline, you have the PPH emergency box. Let's see why we need the emergency box. And it's a must have if you have a delivery, because we said any woman can get. So if you know you are delivering women, you must have PPH emergency box. So let's see. You need to assess airway circulation and breathing. How do you assess circulation? I want my, uh -huh, those ones. Then these will, uh, they will just say, you see those ones. Yeah, so. Circulation, we need BP. Do you see why you need a BP machine close by? You need to empty the bladder. Do you empty it with what? Which are the end of K? Aha, you catheterize. I have an anger, Mumpaka catheter, Kubato, in an emergency box where to pick it. Ah, oh, the sister has gone home. It's in the then he goes and buys a straw for drinking. So you see why you have to have those? By the time he comes, well, this is midnight, all pharmacies are locked. We are not on laughing matters. These are very serious. You need to rub a contraction, so you need gloves, right? Yes. You need what? You need to set up uh, two large bore IV lines and infuse crystalloids. What do you need? You need a cannula, you need infusion sets, not one. Eh? There they are saying one or two, but two at least, or five. But have maybe as five. You need vacutainers. You need to take off blood for cross matching, grouping, CG, uh, doing the whatever CBCs. You need uterotonics. Don't you need to give? Oh, oxytocin is in sister's office. She has gone home. Sister, come back.
So those even elastoplast, by the way, put it there. Gloves, gynecological glove, if you want to go in and do manual. So are you able to close your eyes and say, this is what I need in my emergency box according to the flow of treatment? Are we together? There, they are saying a minimum of those. Hmm? You need a minimum of three cannulas because one may go wrong, malfunction, and yet you need two cannulas on both sides, on two arms. So please, that is in your guideline, make your emergency box, make your emergency box according to that. And you can put in luxury if you have enough infusion sets, you can put in four or maker. Such as that, I won't take you to that. Next, next, next. So let's go to that. I'll come back to that. Let's go to abridged. We are going to revise. And then we'll go to those last slides again. The bundle approach, the bundle approach or emergency care using the bundle approach is uh, was designed by Massachusetts General Hospital, but done under FIGO, and it is being encouraged by the International Federation of Obstetrics and the International Confederation of Midwives. So I thought I should bring this one to us as a, since we are part of FIGO and part of International Federation of Midwives. What this bundle approach does is that it gives you a way of remembering things offhand. And that this PPH care is bundled in two main bundles and two supportive. Uh, uh -huh. You're done? So, at a glance, those are the bundles, and we are going to go through them one by one. In the first place, you remember Amstel, active management of third stage, for who? For all mothers. So we start with the prevention. Do not forget prevention because then you have fewer PPH patients to, to treat. So in an event that PPH occurs, you make a diagnosis of PPH, then you initiate the first response. You call for help, and then you initiate the first response. Well, why bundles? Because when you've bundled your activities in steps, it is easier to remember I've done A, B, C, D. It has worked or it hasn't. Where do I go next? It helps you to remember all the actions that you need to do. And say, oh, I forgot Peterson. But if you have them at your fingertips, then it helps you. Can somebody get that one off? because it's uh, in my bundle. Uh, I see myself and I don't want to see myself. Uh, you can hide me somewhere. Uh, I may be, <laughs> I may be uh, tempted. Uh -huh, thank you. I may be tempted to keep looking at myself doing this. Huh? Yes. So 
you call for help and then you remember I must do this. And that is the main reason you say you use bundles to remember all actions. Are we together? Yes. So you've called for help. You can ring a bell. You can uh, ring the siren in the hospital. So in your first bundle, there are those four critical things. You remember we massaged the uterus? We remember the IV fluids? Ringers or? But remember you took off blood as you put in the cannula, right? Uh, for the bloods. Remember the what? The uterotonics. Are we together? The utero what? And the tranexamic acid. This is slightly different because the blood, uh, we had it for Ugandan guideline in the first bundle. But here they put it in the, you've done those four, then take a step and look for what is causing the, what is causing the bleeding. So that's when you look for, they call them supportive measures. You look for tears and you treat them. You empty the bladder. You look for tissue, that is you empty the uterus. In other words, you look for the tissue and you see if there is tissue. Are we together? If the woman continues bleeding or if she had stopped and bleeds again, we call it refractory PPH intervention. So what is there? Three things. You want to have that uterus contracted. So that's when you use by manual compression. You see there are two compressions. The upper one is external by manual compression, or you put in your hand, you make a conde, and you do internal by manual compression. Are we together? Either you do on the uterus or with a nice glove you put in inside, you make a chikonde around the cervix and the other arm is on the abdomen and you do what? Internal by manual compression. The next is uterine balloon tamponade. I think we've been teaching this and this. If you know that you do not know how to do it, then we need to teach you. Way before PPH, workers, because you are not going to run on the patient. We have Mama Natalie's uh, uterine Natalie, I think Natalie's uterus or something like that. Mama Natalie's uterus to learn that way before PPH workers. When it occurs, you should be having that on your fingertips. And then the third one is you've put in your balloon tamponade, then you can put this woman in an anti-shock garment and you transfer this patient to a higher level. Don't run to put a nurse when you've not stopped the bleeding. She's going to bleed in it because the nurse is essentially trying to bring the blood from the lower extremities so that the vital organs are perfused. So now if you've not stopped the bleeding, you even push the blood from the legs to go and bleed out. Are we together? So please put the nurse as when you've made sure the uterus is contracted, you've done those by manuals, you've put in a nanti, a uterine balloon, and then you can do the nurse. Now, that's supportive. If you know that you are at the lower health unit, put the nurse, after you put that nurse from You've stopped the bleeding, you've put the nurse, send the patient to a higher level. 
And don't say from her center three, I'm sending to her center four. Where do you want to send this patient? Where there is at least a, a surgeon means a, a gynecologist or at least a, somebody who can do surgery. Because you can see after you've referred, mm -mm. the next uh, things that you need, surgery, you refer, you've given blood, you refer to a higher level, and then they may need to do what? To do surgery. So please remember when you've done the refractory, which has by manual compression of the uterus, either external or internal, or you do external and internal, whichever you think is uh, helping you, or you put a balloon tamponade, you put the nurse and refer. Because the next level will be what? Probably surgery. The continued care of this woman. Many times we control the bleeding and then we go away and we don't do more and the women still die. So we must monitor in the next 24 to 48 hours when the woman is stable. You monitor the tone. Is the uterus continuing? And that's why that infusion helps with pitocin over four hours. Monitor the uterus is continued to be contracted. Monitor the vital signs. Continue estimating the ongoing blood loss. You remember in the first, uh, the first, uh, the prevention session, I said that trickling can also cause issues. Yeah, so continue estimating. Mm -mm, she's trickling. Where is this blood coming from? And do something about it. Ensure adequate fluid intake. Remember, we said uh, under estimation of blood loss. So if you think she has lost a liter, you probably want to put in three liters times three, your estimation. Blood transfusion is necessary, but monitor what you are transfusing. Some get uh, reactions and they die from reactions, not from the PPH. Monitor urinary output. If she doesn't produce at least 30 mils in an hour, you know you are not putting in enough. And make sure there is a continuous presence of a skilled attendance, attendant. You've done your bit, you go away, you leave a nursing aid and everything is undone. Above all, maintain documentation. You see, we are on do, 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 do. And then you finish, oh, I've saved this woman. And you go home without documenting a thing. Hmm? Oh, we control the PPH, full stop, and you put your name and go. Tomorrow you find the woman dead. And they bring the, the what? The file to Dr. Sebuko to do confidential inquiry. He doesn't know that you did anything. All he sees is the woman had PPH. PPH control, how? So documentation is good for knowing that you've given good care for quality of care for those who are going to follow up as they read the notes, but also it saves you from litigation. They are starting to pick you one by one to be taken to answer for you. Huh? And don't say I'm a midwife, they won't take you. The very first bundle is midwifery, if you don't know. Thank you very much. I want to quickly go back to the other additional slides because you asked a question about some of those drugs. So let's quickly go to them. And then you can ask your questions. So I hope you are writing the questions. Yeah, we are soon coming. Then you can write those later. <laughs> you see, I told you when I was looking at my slides, the next slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
Yeah, you have time to write your questions. Yeah, thank you very much. You can see how an uh, analog we are these days and when we are going into these hybrid sessions, it becomes very interesting, but thank you very much. So these additional slides are uh, added because there were some questions on uh, some of this stuff. Uh, the pharmacological agents that we are using, we all, I'm going to be talking about the doses this time. Eh? Oxytocin, we know we give it IV or IM. That is for treatment, that is for prevention. And uh, uh, we are not talking about induction of labor because it's beyond, uh, it's out of this uh, workshop's mandate. But we know that we use it for induction of labor and the dose is tailored to piety of the mother. Don't see gravida six para five and you put 10 international units and you start running it. Eh? In other words, don't induce labor in lower units, bring it up where the people have been trained to do that. So 10 international units IM or IV for prevention, but also for treatment, you can start with that and maintain with 20 international units in a liter of normal saline. That one runs very slowly. If you don't have oxytocin, we have IM ergometrin. Uh, it is a 0 0.2, and you give it in non-hypertensive mothers. Those who have misoprostol, let's run down. Misoprostol, we give 800 micrograms. That is for treatment. If it is for prevention, we give. 600 and don't wait for pph like my friend told me during break time you also give it as active so you've delivered the baby there is no other baby i like that and then you can do your other things controlled code detraction are we together yeah don't wait but now we are treating. You give 800 micrograms sublingual. Uh, I know that uh, here we have his uh, giving me a tip that this is uh, 20 international units per liter of normal cell line. That is what is given internationally. That is what is in the... But I know we usually say 20 to 40. So you can put your 20 in your 500 mils. Yeah, but for those who have liters, I know there are some who have those giving fluids as a liter. 
you still put in 20. Yes. And then uh, they say if bleeding persists, you give carboprost, but I don't think we have carboprost here. So let's jump it and we go to what? To misoprost or you put it in cabina. Me, I'll tell you what I usually do. I continue running the what? The pitocin, but I add in. And then I try to look for, is this uterus contracted? Do I need to do those by manual compressions? Are we together? Or do I need to put in a uterine balloon tamponade? Are we together? Don't say, I've used normal, um, my oxytocin is running. Mm -hmm. As long as the uterus is not contracted. You know, we must midwives and doctors have contracted uterus. You feel it and it is still boggy. Throw in something else. Put in my, my what? Mysoprostol, uh, sublingo, others put it rectal. Please don't forget tranexamic acid. Somebody wanted to know tranexamic acid. You give it over 10 minutes. Remember, it's a 10 mil ampule. It's one gram in 10 mils. So you run it over 10 minutes. And after 30 minutes, if the bleeding continues, you give another dose. Are we together? Or oh, sometimes the bleeding stops, but within 24 hours, a few hours later, six hours over. How do you say it in Rutoro? Then you repeat tranexamic acid. Ideally, the best time is to give it within three hours of starting bleeding. That is WHO recommendation. So if the woman is still within three hours of starting to bleed, give her an examic acid. One ampule, over 10 minutes, slow, chew, pushing. 30 minutes later, she's still bleeding. Repeat the dose. Or later, she starts bleeding again within 24 hours. Give a second dose. Specific management of retained placenta. What do you want me to talk about today? What don't you know? The placenta is retained. You want to do manual removal and anesthesia, isn't it? I don't know whether they teach the midwives to do, do they teach you midwives? You do manual removal, but you do it in the theater. No. And, um, and a verbal cane. Yes. Oh my God, and a verbal cane. <laughs> Dr. Sebuko, you know, he's the guru of OBS gain maternal health in the region, Dr. Sebuko. You do manual removal under verbocaine. As if my doctors can, can answer that question. I have always insisted avoid manual removal of the placenta when the patient is not under anesthesia. You will get neurogenic what? Shock. You will kill the mother. Don't prove a hero. And then they will say that the mother died from PPH. Kumbi, the mother died from bad intervention. You know, vasovagal shock, when you have too much pain, the, vena, the vagus system just, uh, and you, you collapse and you may die. Eh? So please, those retained placentas, you might want to send them up for where they are able to. And that is why we sometimes get uterine inversion, because you try to remove ta, ta, and then the uterus comes out like this. And replacement is another issue. So you do massage the uterus after removal, money removal. Of course, you put pitocin and it continues running in the drip. You must check vital 
why the placenta was retained. This is when you must inspect the placenta to see if it is complete. Maybe something may stay there. Hmm? And then you remove it and the mother continues bleeding. Kumbe, there is a cotridon which stayed. Check that it is complete. And I believe if it's Sebuko who has gone it to remove, he explores before he comes out and manage the atonic uterus because retained placenta usually causes uterine. Uterine atony. You empty the bladder. You tell the woman to, to feed the baby. I remember they used to teach us that 30 years ago. I don't know whether they still teach it. Because as the, the mother breastfeeds, oxytocin is released and the uterus contracts. Hey, but don't wait for that. Atony kills bad. We said you give oxytocin or egometrin or misoprostol. Massage that uterus, set up the drip. You know, these things you should be kubiyi in bakati. Mubiyimbe and pudire. You massage the uterus. You set up the what? And do what with it? And then you do what? You connect what? In what? Two lines, one for the running cell line, one for putting in what? Because you are not going to add oxytocin and you run it like the other one, large ball, which is running very fast and in 30 minutes it's finished. That's why you have two. One is running slowly, but one is... <laughs> And then you do what? You inspect, then you do what? You repair if there is a tear and there is no tear, you do what? There is no tear, it is uterine anatomy, you do what? You compress what? By manual compression, external or internal. Mm -hmm. When do you do aortic compression? I know I haven't talked about it and for a reason. Because somebody will say, how do you treat PPH? You do aortic compression. Aortic compression is done in hand in hand with other things we've man talked about. As you are waiting to put in balloon tamponade, you can hold because for it, it just stops the water flowing. It stops the blood coming to the uterus to out. So don't say I'll do aortic compression and then you are, you are stuck there. You do it in between as you wait to do another procedure. You've done by manual compression and nothing is working. You say, please set up for me the balloon tamponade. Then you are holding for the uterine. The uterine is not to supply the blood. So you are pressing a chikonde over the abdominal iota. Just you are cutting off blood coming to the uterus. Then when you've put in the tamponade, then you release. And then you see whether bleeding continues. Usually it stops. Are we together? So the role of aortic compression is in between the procedures. You're just stopping the blood flowing because you are waiting to do the next procedure. She has a bad cervical tear. You are waiting to get repairs done. So you can get your assistant to hold on the aorta. Are we together? You know where the aorta is? And then of course, these maneuvers, make sure you put in a broad spectrum antibiotic. Tears, you look for them and you do repair them. Ensure you have good light. You have the speculars, the cascoses, repair. Make sure if it is a ruptured uterus or a cervical tear, you refer to the 
higher facility. Of course, they will examine under anesthesia, they will inspect for the tears, they will explore the uterus, and they will do laparotomy if need be. And that is for CMOC. And uh, sometimes they do hysterectomy, sometimes they do compression sutures like the one coming. BIC, it's treated at an upper facility. They need to look for those factors and replace them. They need the fresh frozen plasmas, all that is at the upper end. Secondary PPH, I think we had talked about it. Surgical management, come and see me at lunchtime because the majority of you are midwives. So I wanted that picture to say that if the uterus continues to be uh, not contracted properly, when they go in, they may first you, the doctors, you need to first try the bilinch with a, an absorbable suture, absorbable. Don't put non absorbable. We've made some uteruses which have nylon. <laughs> Use a absorbable. So try that, and most times it stops the bleeding. Try B lynch before you try uterine artery ligations and others. Successful management of PPH needs teamwork, needs communication amongst yourselves within the team, but also communicate to the patient and to our relatives. Be in anticipation, plan. Don't plan for PPH to occur, but plan to manage it when it occurs. Make sure that the health system is ready for PPH. You saw that toolkit? Don't say, oh, now I need, this woman needs whatever I pick the don't pick from it because the next time you need something, so don't say, we don't have this pick from the tool. No, you only pick from it when you are going to treat PPH. Early identification is very critical. And of course you manage according to cause. Majority of PPH related deaths could be avoided if we manage labor well and we manage third stage of labor well, active management of third stage. Of course, when you do early decision to refer and for the doctors early decision to intervene, a bilinch may be able to save a uterus for this woman who has low parity. And of course, detection of PPH, you cannot avoid immediate postoperative or postnatal care and post delivery monitoring. The first two hours we said are critical. Make sure you keep looking at this woman. I remember 30 years ago when I was a young doctor, we would tell these women, because you have many patients, you show how you make her feel her uterus. Huh? You feel that? Ah, no, 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 that one, which is like a ball. Yes, you feel how hard it is. Every 15 minutes, please touch and see if it is still like this hard ball. If it's not, please call me. Only day? Yes. And they would do that. And they would help us not getting PPH. It's difficult to predict who will get PPH. Yes, we may talk of the risk factors for PPH, but let's agree that any woman can get. Lastly, I end with that emergency box. Please assemble it and don't touch it unless you have a PPH patient. Thank you for listening. Yes, it's time for that question. Thank you very much, Dr. Jolie. I think that's one of the things that we are the others who are revising, but wanted to see to revise the what? Now, 
I request we get some energizer. Then we go back to the next session. Who will lead us into the energizer? Okay, thank you. They are not going to ask any question. Hmm? They are not going to ask questions first. After, after him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ah, hang I will ready. Sister, these people are still enjoying you. But you, I think I suggest you charge them at a fee. I'll be the one to collect the money. So let's go on our next session, which is going to be presented online as well. Uh, it is Obstetric Hemorrhage Implementation Framework by Dr. Mugwanya. Dr. Mugwanya, are you online? Dr. Mugwanya. Yes, I'm online. Are you online? Um, yes, I'm online. Okay, it's your and time. I hope a colleague will be able to, to project on my behalf from that side. Yes, yes, we shall. It's That's your time. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, happy to be here with you. Apologies, I'm unable to be physically present. I want to thank the organizers of this meeting and the other colleagues. And thank you, Dr. Jolly, for the wonderful presentation and um, orientation. Um, I know the intervention framework uh, comes in, is coming in at a time after we've just reviewed our clinical uh, tools uh, that we use in the manage, uh, to guide us in the management of these clients. Uh, I'm sure one of them was about, uh, okay, not one, but quite a number of them were relating to uh, obstetric hemorrhage. And here, uh, the focus uh, maybe is on uh, PPH and also uh, uh, APH. So the, the, this framework, this intervention framework, uh, came in as a result of trying to, of realizing that most of the mothers dying uh, for over the years that we've tried to do uh, analysis and uh, are checking on, the, on what kills the mothers, uh, over a half, of the mothers that have died in the past periods have, have, have been as a result of hemorrhage. Of course, with PPH having a bigger share, but uh, all the obstetric hemorrhage combined, obstetric, uh, PPH and APH, I think we are responsible for over 52% uh, of the deaths in some, in some years, while others, uh, it would, to the lowest it would go, it would be about 48% of all the deaths that occur that we know are very many. Uh, but we know very well that with these, these deaths, uh, there are quite a number of uh, morbidities that survive. So clients that survive with morbidities, uh, but also even on the babies that actually uh, could be surviving with the uh, complications and others actually dying, but with their conditions uh, that cause their death or uh, their uh, lower and, and, and desired state uh, resulting from hemorrhage at one point. So uh, there came a reason for us to say, 
we, of course, the whole country wishes to reduce maternal mortality. And um, then we, as the Minister of Health and the team and the stakeholders agree that it's high time we, we maybe take a pause and focus on this biggest cause of the deaths that we are seeing. So uh, the team sat and came up with an intervention framework that would be used to guide the implementation of different activities of uh, well thought through set of activities that we know can help us in reducing uh, maternal deaths, uh, especially those resulting from obstetric hemorrhage. But we know that with implementation of this uh, framework and this set of interventions, uh, even the other causes of, of maternal deaths uh, would actually be also handled in one way or the other. Uh, by way of background, we realize that, uh, of course, I know we all know these ones. Uh, the population of Uganda is about estimated about uh, between 43 and 45 million uh, as of 2021. Uh, that's projected population. And the expected pregnancy in these populations are about 2.2 million pregnancies every year. Uh, we know that our maternal mortality ratio still stands a little bit high at 336 per 100,000 live births. And in our region here, in the East African region, uh, I think we still have the highest um, at death, in, of course, uh, next to, uh, to, to, to South Sudan, which has a higher than, uh, one, which one uh, has a one higher than ours. And our target that the country set is to reduce this mortality uh, to less than, uh, to, to at least to 211 uh, per 100,000 live births by 2025. If you go and go to the next slide, we'll see that. So uh, that is how big the problem is. We still have a big, a, a, a big task to do if we are to achieve that, that result. Of course, knowing that if we want to reduce our maternal mortality ratio from 336 to 211, then we have to tackle the big, big reasons that actually cause are responsible for the deaths and maternal death and, and, and PPH and, and uh, antepartum hemorrhage are taking over half of the share of the reasons why women are dying. Then we have to give it a special attention. So this intervention framework will focus on, on that uh, based on that background. Uh, this is really to just give us how big the, the challenge is and the burden that we have. Uh, globally, we see that uh, the, the burden of PPH uh, ranges from five to 25% uh, of all uh, complications and about 8.8% of the maternal deaths in developing countries are uh, resulting uh, from PPH. So um, we have gone through the definitions uh, Dr. J. Beza has really taken us through uh, the definitions of, uh, of PPH and uh, antepartum hemorrhage. And I'm sure now we, we, we are very conversant with that, so we shall not go into that uh, small detail. But uh, okay to note here that the case fatality rate uh, of PPH uh, is still high. We know that very many cases, of course, uh, of, of or that, uh, that, that get uh, obstetric hemorrhage and we appreciate that you actually manage most of these and they may not die. Uh, but among those that are reported to have uh, the diff as, as per defined by doc, uh, Dr. Jebejole Beza explained, um, for example, if it's PPH, a mother losing more than 500 uh, mils of, of blood or any amount, even if it's below that, but actually changes or uh, changes the mother's condition. And, and how many of those actually die? We know that there are interventions that we can actually do uh, by medical and otherwise to prevent all of this uh, before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and even after delivery. But we still see quite a number of them actually dying, uh, even when we are able to diagnose that they have had the, the condition. So the case fatality rate uh, in Africa is standing at 3%. Uh, that's pretty high. And in Asia, uh, compared to Asia, about 1.7%. These two regions are considered to be more of developing uh, regions. 
So um, let us, uh, I think, go deep into this. We know the problem, the, 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 how big the problem is. We can go to the next slide. And I'm sure uh, hemorrhage is one of the emergencies, just like I think we've been going through, uh, where we, we say we put an alarm, we do what, and you know it can scare not only the, the caretakers, sorry, the, the, the health workers, but even the caretakers and everybody. Uh, we know there are quite a number of situations that we have uh, just underlooked or overlooked. Uh, this intervention framework comes to, to open us, our, our eyes, and uh, check on to everything that we know <clears throat> can possibly be done to reduce the risk of, first of all, of the hemorrhage happening, uh, sorry, of the, 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 the hemorrhage complications happening. And then when they happen, we are able to manage the situation and mitigate the, uh, the, the, the effect uh, and uh, also prevent deaths that could occur uh, from that. So um, in terms of trends and, and the regional distribution, uh, this graph is trying to show us um, the trends in percentage of uh, health facility maternal deaths uh, due to postpartum hemorrhage. But I told you the framework is going to focus on both antepartum hemorrhage and uh, postpartum hemorrhage. But we know, uh, sorry, for, for this graph, this is just giving us a quick focus on to uh, the postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, the different years, as you can see them, the lighter blue to, 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 uh, to the deeper blue uh, from 2017-18 to 2019-2020. This is using the MPDSR reports that you usually uh, send after reviewing all these deaths. Uh, so the information picked out of this are uh, rates with those cases that were reported or those deaths that were reported and the cause of death uh, was uh, was classified to be um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage as the primary cause of what? Of death. So this one is giving you different regions. Toro is the region where we are and we are discussing today. Uh, while for some regions we are seeing a change in trend on, on, the, on the share that PPH takes for all the deaths, we're realizing that in the Toro region, it's rather on the increase and not just a gradual increase, but I think I would qualify this to be now at a steeper uh, increase. You can see that uh, in, in 2017, 18, 28% of the deaths were resulting from PPH. And when it came to the next year, the following year, it became 39%. And now last year, it's showing us that actually 57% of all the deaths that occurred where as a result of PPH. Now, this is even beyond the national average uh, where we know PPH was, uh, took on, uh, uh, was responsible for 39%. So among all regions, one of the regions where we should, and if you observe, it's only Toro region and maybe Ankole and, and Ukedi, which are taking on this trend where PPH uh, and maybe West Nile, where PPH continues to be on the, on the, on the increasing side. This is the, of course, we, we of course take acknowledgement that this is a share of all the causes of death. Uh, and this is out of only reported or reviewed cases uh, where the, 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 the causes of death were classified and actually uh, indicated. So this should give us, I think, um, a big reason among all the conditions that we are taking care of here. Possibly we have mastered managing the conditions of the others and we are maybe responding well. Then that shows us that we need to do something special for total region to reduce the deaths that result from um, uh, PPH. So colleagues, the situation is worrying. We are the only one having this trend, that kind of steep trend and continuously increasing. So we need to pay a lot of attention. Thank you, you can go to the next. Um, one wonders, what, why do women continue to die even when we know the reasons why they are dying? Uh, I think we all know that most of the deaths actually that happen here, more than 99% are really preventable. When you review, something could have been done to prevent that death, either before pregnancy or uh, during the pregnancy or after delivery or even during delivery, something could have been done possibly to prevent the death uh, from happening. Now, the purpose of all of this is trying to check, can we now go and close those taps uh, learning from the lessons that we learn when we review the death, can we now go and close those taps in a more systematic way? So this is just a national document giving us just general guidance. 
but now we appreciate that a region like Toro, we even have more reason, more reasons to internalize uh, and and take up these actions and localize them uh, and see how they apply to our region with all the unique factors and characteristics that we have in the region. So why do women die? The reasons are uh, still categorized into the three delay areas. Uh, those delays uh, at the community level in making decision related with the knowledge of the people uh, and their behaviors and so on. Uh, then you have the delays in reaching the health facility. Uh, and this is really more into accessing the health facility. Then the delays in receiving the appropriate care. And this one I want to mention here, the appropriate adequate care. Because receiving care when you've misdiagnosed it is not appropriate. But so all of that is a complex of things that you do to ensure that the mother receives the appropriate care. And this is where we see most of the, 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 the challenges still happening. We may not, we, we have some control, but not all entirely for the other reasons before the person may be at their decision level. Uh, there are many people, many other players are doing a part in educating women and uh, empowering them and so on uh, and communities. Then in trying to make sure the road networks are available for people to reach the health facilities. But now we who are seated here, when the client reaches us, we should at least make do our part and make sure those that have managed to reach us, let us close all the taps that can actually cause a woman to, 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 to either bleed or uh, 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 die because of bleeding in one or the other. So the, 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 these are usually centered around uh, the, the commodities, we know these are interventions that we can do to, to, to reverse things. Uh, uh, the country has been trying, uh, in, sorry, not trying, but it has now adopted even uh, more environmental friendly kind of inter, um, medicines, like now the heat stable carbetocin. Um, so th these commodities and, and, and medicines, uh, their availability, uh, their efficacy, uh, and there are very many other things relating with the commodities, their supply chain, their availability, especially the availability here is being accessible to a person who's managing the patient when they actually need them. Uh, the others are really processes, but of course in the framework we try to analyze along the way because a lot of things have to be done to make sure that uh, the medicines are available to the person providing the services. So we want to look at the whole chain and the whole road when it comes to that. Then we have issues relating with the capacity. Uh, capacity here comes in with the, the knowledge of the service provider. The, here I'm talking about the appropriate knowledge. What Dr. Bezier has been taking us through, what has to be done when, for which type of client, and then what to do after. Then it also comes along with uh, the, the attitude. One would want, would want to say monitoring of delivery, uh, especially in sections and so on. It's kind of an, an item that also uh, relates with also human resources in terms of uh, uh, how we are doing the work. But also there are some system issues that, uh, uh, this is, these are just real examples, system issues like the referral network, inter-facility referral network. I uh, had Dr. Beza mentioning that uh, uh, when you are at center three, you have this client, you put the NASG, you refer to the health center four because the next level of facility. So that kind of a system issue and guidance that now for such a client, you make a decision you have to refer, you take to the next high level facility where uh, really there is more service. Of course, understanding that this, the next type of service this client will require is this type of service and maybe it's the, the other level that it needs to be. That kind of uh, logical systematic linkage of all the different things that help us deliver uh, services. So all of those fall under the three, especially where we are, and we should be paying a lot of attention uh, to this. So this intervention framework actually, so to say, most of the aspects relate with so much on day three, but also there are somewhere we've tried to put, the, there are some interventions within uh, within our uh, uh, sector area where we can do something for day two and one as well. Please next. Next, thank you. This is how the document looks. Um, we, we, uh, we can go to the next. Uh, the target, Next slide. The target of this intervention of, of, of this whole, um, the, the goal is to reduce the maternal mortality ratio from 336 to 211. That's generally in the population. But now, how about those relating with those that have reached the health facilities? Within our health facilities, we still have our matern the maternal mortality ratio or among the deliveries that happen in the health facilities a little bit high. Right now we are at about 92. 
92, this, what, what does it mean? These are women who have come to deliver. Okay, this is a, a ratio out of comparing with the women who come to deliver in health facilities. How many deaths there are relating with, with those ones? We are at 92, meaning these are events reported at a health facility. So we, when, when one expects that when they go to a health facility, then possibly we should do whatever it takes to curb this. And possibly we have the means and means should be put in place for us to, to do something. So everybody has a role to play here. Let the system people play their roles. Uh, let the health, health work when you are at the, the facility and receive this client, do whatever it takes for you to, to, to reduce the risk of death. So we want to reduce this type of death uh, of the deaths that happen reported within the health facility compared with the deliveries that we have, we have to 20 percent, so to 20 per thousand per 100,000 uh, deliveries. So the purpose generally uh, of this intervention framework or activity framework is to provide guidance uh, to over to, to, to function as a guiding tool or a, a point of reference to what we need to do and planning tool to Minister of Health and the other stakeholders in the implementation of very strategically prioritized interventions to address the issue of obstetric hemorrhage, uh, but also provide uh, a monitoring and evaluation plan uh, to, for us to track these interventions because they have been well thought through, they are evidence-based that they actually work. If they are done, they, they, there's a way they, they can actually help us in, re in reducing the risk of death. So that's the purpose of this framework as it comes in as a guidance tool that you can actually check in and say, okay, what do I need to do at my facility? Possibly you go through and check uh, things that apply to your level, and then you try to do something there to, to reduce the, to change the situation. So there are two major components of this whole framework. Actually, there are three. Uh, one is the just framework, just read really this summary of results and how the results flow uh, and how they are anticipated to, to contribute to the bigger reduction of uh, the, the mortality. And then maybe the logical framework and maybe the M and E plan. But in the purpose of this presentation, we are going to focus so much on to the detail that relates with the activities that have been thought through and, uh, and people are uh, convinced that they will contribute if implemented, they have a, a big, as uh, they can contribute very hugely to the reduction uh, of mortality resulting from obstetric hemorrhage. Next slide. Uh, this is really uh, just the results flow. And I don't want to take a lot of time, but uh, most importantly here, we identified two major result area, four major result areas living as objectives. So this framework uh, has intentions, one to strengthen the leadership, accountability, and the policy environment for the management of maternal, of, of maternal and uh, of mothers and children and newborns with a focus on obstetric hemorrhage. Uh, just like I said in the beginning, even we still have babies who are facing complications where the complications have resulted from obstetric hemorrhage. I know we are dealing with mothers as the major issue, but we shouldn't let the baby be alone. These women got pregnant or this, these couples got pregnant to receive a baby. So our focus shouldn't just be on the mother, but the intention is to make sure that we have a mother surviving and also the baby surviving and all of them healthy. So objective two is to strengthen uh, the capacity of the health facilities to provide quality maternal and newborn care services with a focus, with a focus on uh, improving management of obstetric hemorrhage. And objective three is to increase access to essential commodities and supplies relevant for the management of obstetric, uh, obstetric hemorrhage. And then object, objective number four is to increase the health seeking behavior of the women and their families for maternal newborn health services with a focus uh, on management uh, of obstetric hemorrhage. So we are going to go into the, uh, the, each of these, but uh, we, I think we shall go to the next slide uh, quickly so that we, because these ones are in the, in the next parts of the presentation. So we just want to um, download each of the strategic objectives. We've just gone through them. I think we can go to the next slide. I want to pay more attention to where we, we, ha, we, we ca what are the specific things that we needed to do. Like I said, the team sat for over months and actually thought through this whole set of interventions that need to be done for each of the objectives uh, that have uh, that, that we wish to achieve with this uh, intervention framework.
So objective one, strengthening the leadership accountability and uh, policy environment. Uh, we know this is where we have the guidance, the protocols that uh, the, the, the different facilitators have been taking us through and so on. And this is this particular activity that we are having today is as a result of this document being put in place. And then we sourced and said, okay, we agree that we have to implement this to improve the capacity of health workers. And then therefore we had to mobilize resources and then resources were availed and then the activity was implemented. That's the, remember the objective I said, the purpose is to serve as a guiding tool or, and we start implementing a set of those interventions that have been designed. So in terms of this, one of the intermediate results was to, con, um, to, uh, to provide a conducive policy environment for RMNCH with a focus on obstetric hemorrhage, uh, having policies in place, strategies and guidelines, uh, have functional coordination and accountability platforms, and then uh, increase the existence of reliable financing mechanisms for priorities to prioritize that prioritize the special obstetric hemorrhage, and also knowledge management uh, implemented with a focus on obstetric hemorrhage. Now, each of these has deeper things that are written about them on what needs to be done particularly in our context as Uganda uh, to ensure that we achieve this intermediate result of having a more conducive environment uh, for RMNCH. For example, now the RMNCH, the, the policy environment, now we have guidelines being reviewed, for example, the essential, the essential maternal newborn care guidelines, which were reviewed and contributed to by quite a number of, of stakeholders and especially the clinical people. They are, they are now, they have been signed off and they, we are now doing more dissemination of the content of these guidelines with you, provided the clinical guidance, but also the policy environment also being set for some of the areas that could have maybe uh, uh, policy hinges uh, that uh, have to be uh, worked on. Um, functional coordination platforms, among other things, uh, uh, a lot of things are being done. Now we are trying to establish and strengthen the MPDSR uh, platforms on a weekly basis every Thursday, the whole country as now the health sector, we converge and now discuss every mother that has died and try to find solutions one at a go. Uh, but also have more regional um, platforms where stakeholders can also see, uh, converge and discuss some of the things. This, this coordination is very important. We've seen quite a number of things. I think colleagues, you can bear me witness that have changed because of this coordination uh, platforms that are existing. So please, these lessons can actually apply. If they can apply at national level, uh, even the lower level, we can have collective lobbying of things that we need to provide, to, to be available for us to provide the service and many things that we can achieve through this. Among others, I'll not go through in depth of all of these, but I want to, to, to mention about the, the knowledge management aspect. When we learn these lessons, it's important for us to document them so that we can actually also uh, maybe teach the others. Uh, but most importantly, when we learn or we collect this information, we should use it. The knowledge management, um, I want to focus on here, with especially our health workers. When we collect information at the health facility, when we see these clients, there's a tendency that we, we think it's for reporting purposes only. We can actually use this information, analyze it using simple tools to see the trend and where the risks, the, the chances, the, the, sorry, the, the gaps are, and then we are able to respond in a quite improvement kind of uh, perspective and, and approach. Next slide. All of those are for things that fall really under uh, knowledge management. Next, please. Thank you. So the next, the the outputs under this, I think I've I've really I've been trying to digest most of these things. Um, the, the, for example, still under the policy environment, I think we all know. Uh, for example, for maternal deaths, we have to review them within seven days. But also the policy, same with some policy environment. Uh, is indicating to us and recommending us to review even near misses uh, or conditions that we think uh, and, and clinical reviews of conditions that we think possibly in the management something could have been done so that we can always have the knowledge uh, transferred and lessons learned among other things. These are really just example of things. Uh, I think we can move on. But the activities, sorry, the activities done under this include also dissemination of these important tools. Now we are disseminating the, the protocols and we are orienting on the protocols. Uh, we have, for things, remember the things we talked about that we know are responsible, availability of commodities. Uh, they, 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 we have guidance and uh, guidance, policy guidance on commodities and commodity management. 
One of the major challenges we have is stock out, continuous stock out of major commodities that we know are life-saving. Uh, but the other challenge that is embedded in there is too much overstocking in some places and with the stock out in, the same, in some places, but within the same catchment and districts. We want to back on to doing redistribution, for example, as a prioritized activity. Remember I told you these are prioritized interventions that are well thought through looking at the low hanging fruits that, fruits that we can actually uh, harness or we can, we can harvest during this time of implementation of this framework period. So one of the activities prioritized here, and I want to pay to attention to it here, is the redistribution of commodities. In most of our districts, actually, we have commodities that are life-saving in some facilities overstocked there and other facilities understocked. Now, in the budgeting and so on, I don't want to go into the detail, sometimes the allocations are done and it's going to be very difficult to make budget adjustments midway. The best thing we can do is try and continuously monitor the facilities that may not be using up these commodities. And then we pull the commodities to places where they are going to be used most. Now, these are simple tools that we can use to guide us in having a uh, check on to some of these problems. We are operating in a local, uh, local government structure and the district local government and the leadership should really be taking charge of this. But as health workers who are using these commodities, remember when a mother dies in your hands, sometimes it's, it's going to not, by the time you say, uh, you see, I didn't have this, already it's attached to you. I think none of us wants to say mother dying when we are providing the care, all the energy that we put in. So let us also put in this extra mile. I'm saying this because we, we have had experiences where the health worker says, ah, those are things of the district, they're the ones to do the distribution. For me, once I report there are no commodities, ah, I don't want to care about it. I'm not saying you people here, for you here, it's possible, possible it's different. But what I'm trying to say here is if an asset speak interest, so that we can have the tools. I think a health worker wish, uh, wishes to have all the tools they need and the medicines they need when they're providing care. So that we don't have complications to manage, uh, possibly don't even have such uh, unfair situations where they are saying the mother died in your hands, even when it is clear, the medicine wasn't available <coughs> or are stocked out, but overstocked in another place. Can we go to the next, please? Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. And objective two, one of the intermediate results uh, is the improved capacity to offer emergency substitute care. Uh, in, in the whole improved capacity of the health facilities, remember the health facilities, to, for them to provide these very beautiful interventions, uh, the capacity relates with the human resources, but also the systems capacity of the health facility to ensure that the medicines that are needed at the health facility at the service delivery point here, maybe the MC maternity or postnatal ward are there and on time, things like that. So the capacity involves quite a number of things, but one of the result areas relates with the capacity itself of now uh, of, of the health workers. The, health, the capacity here relates with components like uh, Human resources skills mix. This is very important. I've, I've gone to a, host, a facility room one time to supervise and found the midwives were put in the places where then there, there's no midwifery and they continue to say, but the, the number of midwives in the maternity unit, a few is in a very inadequate, but they had the midwives put at a place where possibly uh, you wouldn't want to put a midwife. They may not uh, be practicing their midwifery there. So the skills mix and the management of the human resources within the, the environment I'm trying to download this now to the level of the health facility, but as high as it goes, it also touches to the national level and policy environment, uh, where we say, can we now look, we look through the, the, the capacity, the human resource capacity and the mix of the skills at these levels. So each of us has detail of what they can do at the different levels. Currently, the Minister of Health is undergoing restructuring, and we are having deep discussions and very objective, uh, very evidence-based discussions on, okay, what would be the fair skills mix to handle this situation at these levels, given the numbers that they are serving, but also given the capacities and the, the new requirements that we have added on the different levels. That's just with the skills mix. So I, I, we, we, for the different levels, it's important for us to look deeper and relate with our roles, not just look at it from uh, an, an external point of view. Then the other one is, uh, for example, adequate, appropriate and functional equipment what would be our role if you are to provide healthcare and you are the in charge of the health facility? Uh, 
what would be your role in making sure that the health workers there have functional uh, equipment for them to provide the care? Uh, so you, you try now, to, we need to unpack at our levels and find the micro activities that need to be done to ensure that all the time at the points of care, the health workers have this equipment, the BPs to moni the, the, the monitoring equipment, for example. Uh, and many times these vital signs and, uh, and the things that we usually monitor can actually tell us a lot, but how often do people actually use them to actually ensure that we can identify the risks when they are when uh, warning signs and maybe uh, do something about it. Uh, for example, functional and accessible, efficient emergency referral service means uh, currently, I think we have seen a, a change into the referral system, especially for, for, for the health sector and where maternal health is prioritized. Now, at our level, maybe say at the health facility, how do we position ourselves? Which activities do we need to do to position ourselves to tap into this resource of the centralized or regional uh, form of ambulance and referral system? What activities are you doing at the health facility? Uh, do we have someone responsible for linking with the ambulance services? Now they are going to be opening up regional hubs. Have we got a contact and linkage with regional hubs? How best can, can have the health workers, all of them been oriented to the regional referral network or hub that this is what they have to do. We get the SOPs and orient the health workers. Now that is an activity that you can do at your level at a health facility to make sure that people now uh, have access to this uh, functional referral system. So uh, these are really, uh, just I would say, the activities may be mentioned at, uh, at broad sense, but we need to download them at our level to, uh, to get the clear activity that can be done relating with our context here. Please go to the next activity. Next slide. Okay, thank you. And of course, no, we, we, uh, the, the con one of the assumptions that were made into this intervention framework, there are some assumptions. Uh, one of them is uh, that we have some local resources at our facilities. Uh, for example, uh, RBF, among other things. We want to make sure that we, we, we've provided you with the guidance on such activities that you can do uh, and use some of these resources that have been available, opportunities that have been available to, to close some of the gaps without waiting for uh, external funding or uh, things that may be planned for from the center or at district level. Uh, so one of the outputs here is uh, having an adequate skills mix. I think I've uh, really gone through uh, this. Uh, we, one of the activities that are going to be done is to conduct a national baseline survey assessment of the skills uh, of the CADA and the skills mix at the different uh, levels. And we want to do mapping of what could be the, what you would call as critical uh, human resources for especially maternal health. I remember in the last time when we were prioritizing recruitment of critical staff, there was a special function as health center force. There was a mass recruitment of health center of medical officers and midwives, but they had no analysis. So the health center force didn't function. So this is coming in now to make sure that all of those are well thought through. If someone just wants to think about what who is that what critical resources, they know that this are also equally critical resources and also ambulance services for different levels are, are critical resources to, to, to map for especially maternal health. Uh, conduct training and mentorships. Um, for health workers, one of the things we are doing today is building our capacity. Uh, this is one of the things that we're doing to improve and strengthen the capacity of the health facility that we are operating uh, to provide essential maternal newborn health care services. Uh, and we want to also put a focus on uh, and building capacity of the new technologies that keep coming up. Currently, we, 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 we have been uh, we, we have been clear to have now uh, heat table carbetosin and tranexamic acid. Now, the good thing we have had the capacity built for us to make sure that these uh, commodities can be used adequately, even for the different purposes. Then uh, establish uh, establish uh, laboratory for intrapartum care, uh, skills, uh, skills lab for intrapartum care. And this skills lab is one of the activities the national level and regional level are supposed to be doing uh, to ensure that the capacity building is, is a bit uh, regionalized and Colleagues can always go there and build their capacity whenever they have a gap or a gap has been identified. Next, next slide, please. So objective three uh, focuses on increasing access to essential commodities and supplies relevant for the management of septic hemorrhage. And here, one of the results is to have, to have improved access by the clients on essential commodities and supplies. 
Um, we've had situations where clients come to health facilities and can't access these commodities. So the activities, depending on your circumstances and your situations, uh, need to be coined to the fine, uh, fine level that relate with solving the challenges that could be observed or known for failing clients to access services. Uh, one time we had a situation where uh, uh, the medicines would be locked in under uh, lock and the key, and they are only released at the instruction of the in charge of the unit. But the clients would come and the in charges are not there. And we used to have very many situations where clients would come and they can't access the medicines, but the medicines are actually locked and we are overstocked at the facility. So such situations now deserve an, act, uh, an activity that you can implement within your facility. It can be a quite improvement activity, among other things, to ensure that that gap is actually closed so that the clients access the medicine. Because it's not about the facility having medicines, but the clients accessing the medicines and so on. So we wish to see efficient functional network, for example, of blood and blood transfusion services at all levels that are, are supposed to be having. That is the health center falls and above. Uh, in efficiency here, we also want to look at the components of having blood supply made available whenever it's required, but also even within the health facility now, there must be mechanisms of having blood accessible to the client when the need arises by reducing the time of the decision to transfuse to the point when they actually transfuse uh, the blood. Because sometimes we've had, this is actually very common in our region, in this region of Toro, We've had situations where they have reported uh, blood is available at all facilities, but we continue to see clients don't access the blood. And this is possibly resulting from very many reasons, laboratory issues, it could be management issues, it could be uh, the mode and of the health workers, among other things. So if we can't solve all of them, at least let us solve those that are within our hands. Then we need to see also uninterrupted access to efficient commodities in the management of, of zetric hemorrhage. And uh, this, uh, of course, just like I've been explaining, the different levels have very many tasks to do, and there are different uh, uh, opportunities where they apply. Then also, I wish to see access to efficient and appropriate technologies uh, for managing obstetric hemorrhage. Uh, one of the means of doing this is this capacity building session we've been having. Uh, we are bringing in the new technologies, the NASGI, among other things, the, uh, the, the balloon tamponade uh, and the options that can be used for that if you do not have the, 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 the other, uh, the, 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 the standard one to say that we can apply things within our context and maybe within the environment and the tools that we can access easily access within our situations. Uh, next, so the kit of activities in here, uh, for, for us to have efficient, for example, functional uh, network of blood, these are a set of activities that have been tried to design to, to have this, this happen, functionalized bloody banks in all regions. We are trying to work on this. We are making sure that all regions have blood banks. And at central level, I think this is an item that has been now planned for and pushed for at the different levels. We are having regional, uh, sorry, uh, blood storage facilities at the different lower levels so they can supply different hubs. Uh, an example is West Nile. I think we've tried to establish uh, a, a midway um, collection point, uh, I think in Nebi district, it's not a regional fire hospital, uh, but at least to make sure that they can cover a region uh, that uh, the, the other region was being covered among others. Then also establish uh, storage facilities within the same facilities. We've had situations where people have the blood, but they have to go now to the health center, to the hospital, uh, and, and then bring blood. Then there brings also another question. Should I transfer the patient? Should I go and go pick the blood? Things like that. So we want to make sure that uh, at the different levels, there are these blood storage facilities. So when a facility is planning, for example, these are some of the activities you need to embark on too. If the issue is blood storage in your facility, you can come to this framework, tease out an activity, internalize it clearly if you think it can solve a problem that you have, then maybe use the resources you can have. You can pursue a blood bank or even lobby the stakeholders. Sometimes we have stakeholders come to our facilities, but we cannot explain what challenges or gap that they need to fill for us to be able to provide emergency observatory care services. Next, please. Just like I mentioned, uh, the, the activities are many. So we, here we prioritize one stream of one uh, output. So you, when you get access to the, the whole framework, the set of interventions are there. And this is just to show us how they have been uh, put out. So an objective for, for example, of uh, trying to help improve the health seeking behavior, and this is to address uh, delay, especially day number one, uh, we wish to see the clients, of course, coming in in time. One of the immediate results is to increase the client satisfaction 
their satisfaction relates with, of course, the way we're providing the services. <laughs> and we know, and when we provide the services, uh, the th it is a theory that once the clients are satisfied or they believe in the health belief model, that once they believe that the good services are provided here, then they will come. Uh, someone said that's the reason clients now want to refer themselves to the referral facilities, even when they have the nearest facilities and they are going to just do uh, do a normal delivery or the, even for just antenatal. The very first antenatal, they want to go to the, the, the regional far hospital because they believe there, they're going to receive the service. So can we increase the satisfaction by addressing the gaps that possibly could be reducing how satisfied our clients are to receive the services? I said, this is just one of the result areas, but there have been other results. We've seen the framework that are supposed to increase the behavior or improve the health seeking behavior among other things. One of the activities you can do here under this, for example, is to improve, one I want to achieve is uh, improve the, uh, one thing of the intermediate outputs I need to, to have to have this satisfaction happen is improved maternal, health, maternal and newborn health literacy with a focus on septic hemorrhage, uh, increase the ANC service utilization. Now we are talking about eight contacts uh, so that we can maximize the opportunities of identifying the risks. Uh, but of course, when they come for these services, let us also make sure that we, we serve the purpose the contact is meant to be, uh, among other things. Nowadays, people even identify the risks, but let the client actually go. When they, there is no information given the client or even nothing done about the risk that has been identified. Then increase the skills birth attendance. It's one of the results that you would wish to, to see to uh, as an indication to you that uh, the health seeking behavior has improved and the clients are satisfied with the services. Then uh, increase the level of involvement of the males in seeking health care, especially maternal health care. Uh, we know that we still uh, live in a patriarchal society and their males have a big role to play. No, beyond just impregnating the women, among other things, they still have a lot of work, uh, things they can do to help us in reducing the risks uh, and, and also the maternal deaths themselves. Uh, increased uh, contraceptive utilization, so that we know that one of the single most important, important and effective way of reducing the maternal deaths is the reducing the chances of, of pregnancy, especially for those that possibly are not planned or not desired. Uh, so if you can provide contraceptives and the person does not definitely get pregnant, then they'll die of other things, not possibly a maternal death. Next, please. Uh, one of the outputs here of improved maternal and newborn health literacy, these are a set of activities that have been prioritized, uh, develop and trans translate print material, uh, print and distribute uh, appropriate materials to provide information about maternal health services, mobilize and engage religious and cultural leaders and political leaders to promote maternal and newborn health care services, among other things, conduct maternal and newborn health care education through mass media communication, radio, televisions, among other things. Uh, so these are just sets of activities that have been prioritized uh, under this output, but each of the other outputs of the six outputs that I mentioned under this result each of them has a set of prioritized activities that we think if they are done appropriately or well, they can help us achieve the main objective of reducing uh, the, the maternal deaths and improving the health-seeking behavior uh, of, of these women to reduce uh, the maternal deaths that could be resulting from this. So the way we implemented this, act this activity framework, uh, something I've been emphasizing, go into this big, big framework. This is not exhaustive of all things. You need to go to each of the outputs, sorry, each of the objectives. They are out intermediate results, but also outputs. And each output has a set of prioritized activities that are recommended to be done for the different levels. And now the different levels have been mapped for which activity. Then you internalize it and try to identify the small activities or processes you have to go through at your different levels to implement and achieve uh, those gaps, uh, those results. Um, next slide, please. Yes, uh, what achievements have we registered so far ever since we had this framework? I've told you this is a planning, this is a planning framework, a, a guidance document. Uh, uh, so far since its uh, institutionalization, uh, it was launched in 20, uh, in 20, 2020, yes, 2020. This is the first time it was launched and we had the final revision in 2021. Uh, We've had reductions in the, of course, um, institutional, this is institutional, maternal mortality ratios. These are maternal deaths per, compared with 100,000 deliveries. Please don't confuse this with the other population one. 
these among the deliveries that happen in the health facilities, for every 100,000, how many maternal deaths have we observed? Please, I'm not talking about deaths resulting from only births or deliveries that have happened in the health facilities, no. Deliveries compared with the number of maternal deaths are almost similar to what is still compared with the population level. So within that, we'll try to look at things that we can have control over. So for every 100,000 deliveries that have happened, we have seen about a reduction from 100 maternal deaths now to 92 maternal deaths, uh, which was observed uh, within a space of, of one year. Uh, with implementation of some of these case set of activities. Of course, this is an attribute, it's something that we contribute to. We can't say that this framework alone, is, uh, which has reduced, uh, caused this reduction among other things. So then the other thing is a functional national coordination and accountability framework. With this framework and the guidance and the commitment, because this is a commitment document, we have seen the Ministry of Health try to establish uh, coordination frameworks and they have become more functional and more useful and more, uh, not, not uh, they are always useful, but more, ac more, more active uh, and more action oriented because we have results that we are tracking on this. And that's the, what the M and E helps us to do. You keep tracking on the commitments you've made, how far you've gone and you try to cause improvement in uh, on what you've done. So we have had, for example, we have now weekly MPDSR. I think this one has now fully established and we are doing weekly surveillance of all deaths and we are reviewing all the deaths our review rate of, of maternal deaths has improved it's now in the 80s the 90s for most of the districts and the penetral deaths have also been reviews have also increased and also the, the, the interventions have been done to respond to the issues that uh, we know are the root causes of the deaths have also been responding quite a number of them uh we have the guidelines uh i think under objective one i talked about the policy environment the guidelines have been reviewed to add more uh technologies that have come up and very many things that have been improving over the years. Now the guidelines are with us. So we can use them. The guidelines are being disseminated now. This is one of the activities we are doing to disseminate these, these guidelines. Uh, NDA has registered the heat stable carbetosin and the tranexamic acid as well as one of the medicines that you can use in the management of PPH. Uh, and it, this this one of the guidelines, this, this tool actually is one of the tools that we use to have that kind of expedited approval uh, for, for these commodities. It's not a common thing that has happened in Uganda. Then we have implementing partners have supported the recruitment of critical cadres in different places to cover the gap. I think this is really evident. So what I want to say here, such tools, when you come to a plan or a frame that you want to use to, cover, to, to, to take up a challenge, sorry, to, 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 reduce, to, to, to address a problem, it becomes your planning tool and then you can trade it and you have a basis that you've analyzed your situation and this is what you need to do to improve the situation. And many people could uh, are available to come along and run with you in identifying the solutions, but also in supporting the solutions you've proposed to address the problems. So uh, these are successes that we've registered so far, and these are just a few of them. There are quite a number of things that have been registered. Uh, we've had establishments of, of, of blood collection points, uh, uh, which wasn't really uh, prioritized before. We've had quite a number of commitments have come up from the different stakeholders. The same tool is used by now our development partners now to plan for maternal health uh, services, especially with a focus on reducing uh, this uh, cause of death that is contributing to majority of the deaths that uh, happen as a result of maternal complications and maternal uh, uh, reasons. Next. Next, please. Okay, so among other achievements, uh, we have functionalized health center force now uh, with of course redistribution of staff, very many things have been done. Uh, IP supported implementation on, of MPDSR, and we are now giving a special focus to the response. It's not about just reviewing to appreciate the cause of death, but responding by closing the reason, the gaps that were observed in the review as lessons that we learn from the reasons that uh, why your mother died is the most critical thing of the whole MPDSR process. Then we have monthly webinars to build capacity and exchange knowledge uh, and this, uh, share learnings among other things. Uh, Uganda Blood Distribution Services is now innovating uh, to reduce uh, the unnecessary referrals due to storage of, of shortage of blood by quite a number of interventions I've, I've talked about. Uh, we are creating media awareness. We are having quite a number of, I think, uh, now discussions around this area. So even at your local level, at your facility or district level, you please can take up this and now go to the different radio stations uh, or local radios and talk about these topics uh, and so that people know 
uh, what they need to do for us, for them to, to, to reduce on the risks of, of, of death. Next. Uh, so this last part has the roles and responsibilities uh, on what, who needs to do what in the implementation of this intervention framework. Uh, sorry, I'm really rushing because I know the time is very minimal, very limited. So the different levels here of different categories of, uh, of partners, we have Ministry of Health, National Safe Motherhood and NPDSR committee. This committee has, has, is so broad. It has all people, forms of people and others are even invited based on need. Uh, this committee sometimes even invites those uh, th that we know uh, in that places of authority where they need to do something to happen. Quite a number of times we've invited the permanent secretary whenever we've had issues and she has come and when and some, some things have happened, we've invited district colleagues, we've invited, uh, uh, now we see the, 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 the equipment maintenance units becoming more active than ever before, among other things, with due respect, I'm not saying that they have not been active. So there are quite a number of things. This committee is wide and covers government partners are always there. We invite them also on need and purpose whenever we need to have discussions. So even some of the members here, all these colleagues here are actually part of that committee. So we have implementing partners, we have health facilities, health workers, academicians, uh, CSOs and the community. All of us have a role to play in implementation of this uh, intervention framework. Next. Yes, so uh, I want to thank you very much for listening to me. I know it has been a long talk, uh, uh, especially that I'm speaking virtually. Uh, you can't touch me, but uh, that's the summary of how our intervention framework has been structured. Please have access to it. I have not detailed everything that is in there. If you realize in each of the objectives, I would go just pick up one intervention for uh, intermediate result and one output. There are quite a number of things. So please go in there, say, look at the prioritized interventions, try to customize your own setting. If you think that some of them may not be applicable to your settings or you've achieved all of them, you can even look at your situation and identify some new activities that you can actually put up. And the last parts of the presentation, we are showing you that with this intervention framework being put in place, we have been able to lobby and look for resources the sources not only in terms of money, but also human resources, among other things, and something has been done to change. So please, planning is not a bad thing. It should, it's not a waste of time. You can take off time at your health facilities and your districts, plan very well. Now focus so much on the things that you know are going to cause impact or change in the situation that is actually pressing so much. And here we're discussing maternal deaths resulting from obstetric hemorrhage, among other things. So I want to thank you very much. The committee, uh, the, the, these are the teams that worked onto this. And uh, this will have the document with us. It's an official document of the Minister of Health. Please let us use it. Uh, appropriately, I've been describing how best you can use it to support us in improving the whole situation. I want to thank you very much. And I want to thank the other facilitators uh, for the work well done and the job well done uh, to build our capacity. Uh, and we hope that we can do something to reduce uh, maternal deaths. Thank you. And please don't forget the baby. Those women got pregnant to get a baby. So as you focus on the mother, even the baby, should also be given some attention. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Yes. Doctor, those are your hands. Have oh, you thank those you. Hands? Thank you. Uh, Doctor, much. of course, we are grateful for the detailed explanation of the framework. I want to allay your worries. It was a bit of a marathon, but we are going to give you a copy of the framework and we shall give you another book a soft copy using the emails you have given us, the essential and maternal newborn clinical guidelines of Uganda. We, shall, we are going to send them on your emails right now, okay, for reference. So the presentation looked a bit complicated, but very important. So don't worry. I, I read it from your faces. You're imagining the framework is like a cobweb, but it will become easier when you, you at it in detail. Now, that was the last presentation we had. I have a few communications to make before we proceed. One is for logistics. Uh, let me thank you for having responded to the invitations, those of you who managed to come and those who are online. Uh, those who are here, for those who, are, who came from far places, to be given some party because I think some of you had to sleep over so that you keep time. For us who come from within, shall get transport refund. 
And we have a few hard copies for the guideline of obstetric hemorrhage. And when you are signing for your facilitation for transport, you pick a copy. There is a group which is very big, the group from the Renal Referral Hospital, I think one person can pick one copy. I think Sister, Sister Hannah or Sister Anne, one of you can pick it on our behalf. For us from the referral hospitals, let's not pick a copy. We shall use all that copy. And then since we have soft copies, we shall see how to organize ourselves. Leave the copies for our other colleagues. Uh, lastly, we have a session of question and answers, okay, which can take about 15 minutes. And then we shall break off for lunch. So logistics can be taken with lunch. So you, you pick them, sign, and then take your lunch, and then you can safely go back to your to your station. Unless otherwise, if there are any more communications, they should be made now. Are there any other administrative communications, Stella? Okay, right. So let's go on our last session, which is question and answers. Those online, are you still with us? Those online. Yes, we are still with you. Yes, we are there. And they are asking how are they going to receive mm -hmm. uh, the copies of the documents? Just so I know, I, I, I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Uba Fasum Mubaya. I work with UNFPA. In the region that, you cover, that we are discussing today, we have some districts uh, of focus. Uh, we have uh, quite a number of districts there, and we want to continue to, co to commit that we shall continue supporting. Thank you. You're welcome. We thank you for that. Mm -hmm. How do the colleagues online receive the documents? As we await, come again. The colleagues online are asking, how do they receive the documents? I think they send their emails to the AUGO. They send the emails to AUGO, and then AUGO will send them the soft copies. Maybe we give you the email address for AUGO. I think you put it there online so that they can write, they can always write to Aogo and then Aogo, they receive the documents from Aogo. Incidentally, the people we invited, we had their emails, even those online. So comfortably, we shall send back the copies. Thank you. Uh, as I'm waiting for questions and answers, there is a very big opportunity here. We have the Aogo president. Aogo means association of obstetricians and the gynecologists of Uganda. So we are happy to be with the president of that association who is going to talk to us at the end of the question and answer session. I know you are hungry, but give him a chance, listen to him. He's spearheading assistance in maternal and child health in this country. Thank you very much. So for the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Arthur. And thank you so much to all the presenters and all the participants for this wonderful training and the new guidelines about PPH management shared to us. My only question is, actually it is not a question, just a suggestion about tranexamic acid because it is not easily available by the facilities and the price is relatively high in the pharmacies. Can we have it availed to us in the facilities? Thank you so much. Okay, I think that is taken. In our framework, we are, take, we are talking about available new technologies and tranexamic acid is one of them. I think it was in the framework to be catered for. Thank you. Any other? Thank you very much. Um, basically concerned, yes, we've passed through the management of PPH, the guidelines, and um, elaborated much on the, <clears throat> on the new commodities to use to manage PPH. However, we saw that on referral to different facilities, there are surgical interventions of which we didn't go into the details. 
uh, that is to do with uh, the village. We've seen the, <coughs> so many. So I, I don't know if we, we still need to do it personal to, to, to make sure that if they are referred to your patient, you are at the health center for, you are at the uh, hospital level, you are at the regional referral, and at a point, maybe there is no a super specialized person take over. If we should do it personally, like MOs and other uh, health workers that are supposed to manage the condition. Thank you. I think we shall get an answer to that. Question noted. Thank you, Dr. Arth. Mine is uh, uh, all about DIC. For us at our hospital, we get many cases of PPH, secondary to DIC. I would love to know its management very well before I leave this section. Thank you. Thank you. She, she says management of DIC. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for this meeting. And it has really opened my eyes so much as a midwife. I have a concern on the issue of saying that midwives should not do manual removal of placenta without anesthesia. Now you're in a health center three, the lady is bleeding, no transport. What are we going to do? Are they going to send for us doctors in health center threes? Thank you very much. That is my concern. I missed it. Who can summarize for me her question? She's talking of midwives not doing manual removal of the placenta without anesthesia, and she works at Health Center 3. So her question is, are we going to have surgeons or doctors at Health Center 3? Okay, that is also noted. Any other question? Let's have the last one, one, and we end with the questions. We answer the ones we already have. The last question, no more questions now. Okay, thank you for the presentation. My concern was mostly on, uh, on misoprostol. I would like to know to you some clarification on the prevention of PPH by use of misoprostol. It's mode of action and how quick, like in active management of, of third stage of labor, in absence of oxytocin. Thank you very much. Oh, these are lovely questions. Eh? I can see you want to prevent PPH. Okay, let's have Dr. Beza taking to some of these questions. in this place, you can take on some of them, like that my suppressed of 30 minutes. That's why we put it sublingual when it acts cheap quicker. We don't want to go on some of those. Okay. So let me ask a few questions. Let's start with the last one, Maestro Prosto. Maestro Prosto has two uses in this obstetric hemorrhage. We have the preventive part and the treatment. So for the preventive part, we use 600 micrograms sublingual rectally, which we expect to work within 30 minutes. Is that answered? You asked about the mode of action. That is now a bit deeper. We can, uh, we can read about it, but for clinical purposes. You have another question? But I'd stop. There is a, then, for what? Hey, did, I never talked about tre treatment. It is 800 micrograms. Is it sorted? Yes. Then we go to the placenta. Now, the challenge is you can create and make the maternal death in that procedure. What do you do? That is now another thing which is in the framework, improving the far what? But it's not a good practice. Hmm? 
The good thing, we have all managed these mothers. And we see how they bleed. But also, that procedure can kill. Yes, and it will be one which will bring problems. You will keep on removing placentas, and I think you have been doing it, until the day she will collapse in your hands, which would be a very bad story. So we are on good practices, okay? Let's follow the protocols of management of hemorrhage. But a good practice, we are saying, don't do manual removal of the placenta. It's an easy one for referral to a place which can do it. What do you do to other referral? Is it the only reason where you refer? Like what do you do for obstructed labor at the center three? Even retained placenta. It is a very big problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, my doctors can tell you what they have seen. They are here. Haven't people removed the placentas and got problems? Who was there when the mother collapsed? Who was there? Yes, there is somebody here who can tell you. Because I can tell you, this is now has become like a church. Okay. We, there is a, we tried to, to do manual removal from an evacuation room and the mother collapsed immediately after, after the removal. We had to resuscitate, but it was a bad experience. I think what doctor is saying, it's better if it's done under anesthesia, and you know what you can do there, other than doing it the, the wrong way, and you get problems. Thank you. Now, in addition to that, you will not do it properly. You will not explore the uterus properly, because there is pain. And you are, you, yourself, you are feeling the pain because you are trying to put your hand there. You start sweating. Maybe you will also collapse. <laughs> okay. So those are two questions answered. I think we can go on the surgical management. The, the, I will say that uh, don't mismanage the patient because you say there is no transport. Look for ways of sending this patient over. Talk to the relatives, they will take the patient. I like to ask if it is obstructed labor. Are you going to try and deliver her because she has no transport? In the same vein, placenta retained can be a problem. You saw some of the reasons it gets retained. Maybe it is adherent, a creta, in creta, pa creta. And then you find that your hands are now. <laughs> Where am I now? <laughs> and then you want to refer when you've already perforated the uterus with your fingers. Please refer them. Please explain to the relatives. This is beyond here. And you need to look for money quickly and go. Meanwhile, call and make sure that you make functional systems. Some of you are ADHOs, I was told. So what are you a DHOing if you cannot make referral system work? What is force for that? So somebody wanted to know how the ice is done. And you know, midway is a very interesting. Oh, we manage a lot of BICs, and I want to know today from here how they are done. If you've been managing many, I want to know how you've been managing them then I know that you've been doing the wrong thing or the right thing. <laughs> you see what I mean? The midwife will first address the question and then below the belt. So how do we manage DIC due to hemorrhage? Huh? And we said it can be prior from already causes in the woman. She can be maybe on some drugs which are thinning blood. But it can be also from, she has bled a lot and bled out the factors, isn't it? You see, you are going to get me and me when I get COVID, I get bad COVID. Eh? Yeah, from experience. <laughs> yes, so during DIC, majority or, or coagulation factors, 
<laughs> are depleted, they disappear. Don't start saying, is it factor eight? Is it factor what? Just know that those factors that cause the blood to clot are depleted. So the woman bleeds and there is no single clot. Then you know you're in trouble. So those who are at risk, I, if they are exposed to prolonged hypoxia, hypovolemia, and hypothermia, you know all of those hypoxia, lack of oxygen, hypovolemia, less what? Volume of blood and hypothermia, cold. Mm? So you want to assess, you do the clinical observation. The laboratories, some of your places don't do the, those fibrinogens and factor what, but they do platelets. Hey, you will see platelets and they are at five. <laughs> yeah, so you do clinical observation, you see the blood is not clotting. You do the labs and you see that platelets are not. Is that the next one? Yes. You see that the blood is not uh, clotting. And this will happen when the uterus is contracted. So you are not saying that you, there is still atony. Are we together? Yes, the uterus is contracted, but the woman continues to bleed. And you give your tranexamic acid, which helps with the clotting. We said we give one gram, and we had said it is in how many meals? And you give it over? 10 over 10 minutes. Yes. So when you strongly suspect there is a clotting problem, you give, we call them FFPs, fresh frozen. I don't know whether you have them, but in most places, you should be having at least a unit. Uh, able to uh, pick one unit from maybe the original refer or something. Yes, uh, sometimes the FFPs are not available. What do you do? You give platelets. If you don't have the platelets, you give fresh blood. As fresh as possible, you won't say now the fresh I get from myself and give. Make sure it has gone through the right procedures. So you send to the blood bank and say, please, uh, sometimes they give you blood of that day of the day before. Are we together? Next. Hey, it's finished. So that's what we give. You give TXA. You give fresh frozen plasma or platelets or fresh blood. Then you are, because of fresh blood, we assume it still, have, it still has those clotting factors. Are we together? Yes. Any other question on that, on DIC? And you see why you want to treat PPH early before it goes now to DIC. It was you trying it bled all the clotting factors. Now, lately, you've done the uterus, it's contracted, but you are already now into DIC. And DIC is not very easy to treat. Yes. So, any question? There was another question for me. I think that was all. The, the, the surgicals. You know, uh, when I had started on the surgicals, you saw some people starting to not the heads, even uh, doctors included. Eh? So I don't think if you are a doctor, you need a specific now training. How is B Lynch done? How is the laparotomy done? How are the cho the other cho stitches done? Uh, you try an artery ligation. How is it done? So you cannot start now going into step by step those things when majority of the people here are midwives. That would not be fair. But in case you don't know how to do that, I think we can uh, task Dr. Sebuko. 
to core them in and we give them another hybrid. He's there training, Dr. Musa, another president, is maybe online and we do a mini skills drills over those surgicals. Is that a better thing to do? Yeah, you could also do or call me. I used to know how to do them, but uh, I tasked that too, Dr. Sebuko and Dr. Musana to arrange for that. And it could be another half day. Don't think it's a, a one session thing. Are we together? Thank you. So it calls for surgical skills improvement in our area. So let's discuss that on our Renzori group and we see how we solve it. Uh, we did a, a, some activity with uh, Ntoroko and Bundibujo for skills improvement, but let's discuss it on our Renzori group and we get an answer, okay? It is about skills improvement. There is an answer locally, don't mind, okay? So I think we've gone our second last activity. Okay. I'd like to invite our good president, Dr. Othneil, that name disturbs me. Othneil Musana, the president. And I have the honor for the first time to invite him to address people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sebko Arthur. So, so my pleasure to be in Fort Porto. I hear big things about these big people. I am Othiniel Musana, an obstetrician gynecologist, though I prefer to be called a gynecologist because I don't see many pregnant women. So I cannot claim to be an expert in managing PPH. So my knowledge is entry level obstetrician in PPH. But because I'm an oncologist, I'm normally called to do the complicated surgeries like previa, where things have gone wrong. And I have had people thinking placenta previa, placent, pretend placenta is something simple, you'll kill a woman. Sometimes women don't die because nothing was done. We just did the wrong thing. And it's very important for us as professionals to understand what we are doing. From first principles, and I was always told that when you go to a, a place and you speak, the lowest level card must understand you. And in our case, as O and G, it is the enrolled midwife, sometimes the nursing aid. Otherwise, you will not save lives. So I would like to talk about AOGU. AOGU is the Association of Social and Gynecologists of Uganda. It's been in existence for 37 years, since 1985. And the roles keep changing. And Uganda keeps growing. By the time it began, there were a few Ugandans, now they're over 44 million. There was one training school, now there are about six training schools for O and Gs in the country. At that time, most O and Gs were in public service, but now most O and Gs are in private sector. At that time, most O and Gs were in Murago and General Farah hospitals. Now, many of them are even at Health Center for employed as medical officers. So things have changed. Things have changed. So who, who are we as AOGU? One is our vision is to be leaders, to offer leadership in reproductive health. I think as that set as you shall so. And our mission is to advance reproductive health services by excellence. We want to be excellent in clinical practice. We want to be excellent in educating our members and even the rest of people who manage in this, in this area. We want to do research. Some of the work we are doing here is research. We're seeing what's, what's wrong with Fort Porto. What can we help? How can we improve things? Collaborations. We collaborate with the Midwest Associations, Ministry of Health and other partners, UNICEF and the rest. And what we are entering to now is advocacy. We want to make sure the welfare of our people dealing with our mothers is good. People are paid well, people have good working conditions, people have the tools they need for their trade. So what are our priorities? One of them is developing, disseminating, and updating 
evidence-based safety bundles like we are doing here. So NASMIC and our members in NASMIC, some of you have been following NASMIC activities. It's normally led by the ONG people. They are developing, disseminating or updating existing guidelines. Evidence-based, not saying because I was trained in 2006 and we used to deliver while stepping on the table, things have changed, we're now on the floor. Okay, so there must be evidence-based. People are asking why Kabeto scene, why evidence keeps moving. Okay, and you must be updated. Otherwise, sometimes you may do the right, not the right thing, you do something which is outdated. We want to increase and improve access to ONG services. We must know where the ONGs are, where are the midwives? Somebody asked about referrals. If you don't know where to refer, you've destroyed access. It means the patient cannot access services. We want to do research. But of importance, we want to do a lot of quality improvement for sexual and reproductive health. And some of us are here to strengthen networks. When I meet doctor, I'm like, give me your number. I want to make a network. Maybe he will employ me in the future. Yes. But remember that O and Gs, we are professionals. Midwives are professionals. So we must behave in a professional manner. And professionalism keeps shifting as evidence grows. So for the O and G, it is somebody who must have an M O and G or equivalent, whatever you're trained from, whether it is from heaven, whether it is from us, whether it is from Kenya, as long as you come in and you're allowed to practice here and you can conform to the technical standards. So I must do Caesar roughly the same way he does Caesar because the technical standard, when they say don't deliver a placenta without analgesia, it's a technical standard. Otherwise you're not professional. And sometimes we can punish you for it. Please refer, please consult, it is professional. I told you I'm not the expert in PPH management. But because I'm a professional, I will say, Dr. Beza, things are bad. What do I do? Okay, I will consult or I will refer. Okay. So some of the things that professionals have, one of them is the motivation. Why are we why do we join medicine, midwifery? Is it for money? Some of us want money, some of us want to serve, and other things. Okay. Now, there's a whole chatter about professionalism, but one of the things is uh, you must commit yourself to professional competence. Some of you, why we are here is to commit to professional competence. Things have changed. It means uh, yesterday you were incompetent, today now you're competent. But you may be as senior as Dr. Beyes. Competence is very important and you must commit to it. Then number seven, you must update yourself in, in your area of specialization. Really, if I'm an obstetrician, and I'm doing 10 CPDs, and nine of them are stroke in diabetes, this, I don't know, kidney, what? What about my area of specialization? Okay. Then, of course, you must meet your responsibility. And part of them is licensure, the APL. Midwives have their license also from the council. And the other one is subscribing professional bodies. And as AOG, we have four members who must register 100,000, then subscribe annually 160,000. We also have our other members who we work with, who are called associate members, the midwives. And actually, AOG, most of the work we do is with the associate members because you're the majority and you're the biggest cadre and the most important cadre. So same thing, registration 100,000, then annual subscription is 50,000. That's the right one. So if you are a professional, number four is very important. You must be accountable. Why are women dying? Were you absent as the medical officer? Did you refuse to refer? Did you say me out? I trained 20 years ago, I've worked 30 years, so I know a lot. You must be accountable. Then of course, regulation. My senior should regulate me to make sure I am a professional. Who is an expert? I like these two things. When I begin in my MMED, I learned them a lot and I, and I take them to detail. Do you want to be an expert or do you want to be experienced? They are a bit different, 
Sometimes they can be combined. You can be an expert who is experienced in your expertise. But if the first thing you front is, I'm very experienced, I'm more experienced than you, in what? That's why I'm saying I am not an expert in managing PPH. Because it's not my daily bread. But I'm an gynecologist. So I can refer to him who 23 years ago. Because he's done being those, those things. Not because I'm the PNO, yet you can't even do a VE. So refer expertise. So the expert is the person who has the reliable technique, reliable source of technical skill. And so being the same, the right, the same thing the right way every time. So if I'm in placenta, maneuver placenta, I must do it the same, I must do the same thing, same process, the right way every time. If they say give analgesia, give analgesia. Otherwise, you'll become a quark. Mm. And experience, some of the times when we are training students, they come and say, May I do more scissors than you, the, the, the specialist? And you, and the, when you tell him, Okay, show me, and he's doing the wrong thing. Expertise, basically, sort of experience, sometimes you're doing the wrong thing with increasing confidence. And many of our health workers are like this. I have been doing this for 30 years and nobody died. I've always achieved hemostasis. But patients are being now referred to Morago to treat your complications. So it is good to be an expert. You can't know everything, be an expert. So in medicine, we have the offices. I choose my words carefully because I'm a leader. How many people at this level of cadre, senior consultants in this room. Ah, okay. How many consultants? How many special grade? How many PNOs? No PNOs here. How many nursing officers? ADH was, I think, a level of PNO, I think. At that technical ability, you must have achieved something like that. Or it's just, okay, I'm not sure. So the senior consultant runs an office. That's why I put the word, the office of the office. They must get paid. And they must have cars. They must have a driver. They must have bodyguards, I think. Plus even a lead car. I think the most because they are serving the nation, and their role is to assure. You know what I mean? Assurance. When you're saying blessed assurance, we are assured that you're going to heaven. So those people must assure us that the services we are delivering are of quality. That is why when we came, I didn't speak about PPH. Somebody at that level spoke about it because they are assuring us that things are okay. But senior consultants are not supposed to be doing small, small things, tasks. Caesar. When I find a sniffer time doing more scissors than the MO is a problem. Yeah. So the senior consultant, their work is, is big. Grand rounds, major world rounds, leading meetings. Technical meetings attended. A lot of their work is in meetings, meetings, because they have to make sure, assure us that things are okay. Same thing with people at the at that level. If I find that she's the one dump dusting this, I'm working hard doing what? Who will do your work? Supervision, training needs, quality plans, performance management, appraisals, eh? guidelines develop. You've seen them developing guidelines here. So they are, they are assuring us that things will be okay and services being developed. Now the consultants, their work is to supervise. I, I can't tell the equivalent in nursing. I don't know if it's a nursing officer, I'm not. It's SNO, that level, is that level, yeah? SNO. Your work is to supervise, okay? The supervisor is the one who observes and directs, the one doing the tasks. You must supervise. It means you must know how to do the task and show them they do it well. Okay. 
and it must be done in a timely manner. So for us as consultants, I'm not one by the way, you have ward rounds, clinical meetings, CPD training, clinics held, support supervision is for the consultants. I must appraise the special grade. And sometimes I do research. So the SNOs are around that level. In nursing, so when I find the SNO is fighting for other BF money with the EM, there is a problem. It means she, she doesn't know what she's supposed to do. That's why I do not improve because not supervising, not teaching, okay? Then for us, the special grade, we're the ones who provide, who do the tasks, eh? We do the scissors, clear lines. The ones who clear the lines, run the clinics, we do the operations and, eh? and of course, sometimes help interns train other things. That's our, that's our work as special grade. That may be at the level, I think, of the nursing officer, depending on, depending on your hierarchy in the institution, okay? So don't go saying because, Musana has the same qualification like Dr. Sevuko. We are the same. No, he's a consultant, so he must supervise me. Otherwise, I also want to grow. So then we have people who like feeling big. Sometimes they are big, but the offices, people who have offices there. You know, when you're in administration, the hospitals were not built for administration. Do you know that? What were they built for? Treating? Patients. So when you're in administration, you're not the boss. You support system. You support the people doing that work. So you make sure that they are supported. You must go for meetings to make sure they are. You must do budgets, make sure supplies are available. You make sure that uh, all those things, targets, if you're a word manager, you're supporting the team. Sometimes you may be a word manager, but on the team, there is somebody more senior than you technically. So don't assume because I'm the manager, I'm the special grade, I'm the head of department. I'm, I now make, make decisions clinically when Dr. Beza is there. No, it doesn't work that way. You have to understand your role and play your role. That's why women die. So I would like to go on to the next presentation. And I want to iron out, that's in my view, why do women die? Because really we have done so many SOPs, so many guidelines. And guidelines are a very important tool, but guidelines have to be implemented. Okay, so some people have done their work and made the guidelines. Now the issue is we must implement the guidelines. So the senior consultant is the is the boss of the guidelines. It's supposed to assure us that things can be okay and be done. In them. The consultant supervises how we make those how we use those guidelines. Then for us, the Kayola special grade, which we, we do, we do, we do, we do, we do, and then things work. So know your role, know your role. So I'd like to give a, yeah, you can go. So why do women die? Is it because of, usually when I'm listening to audits on the Nazimek and the other thing, I'm like, oh, okay, woman died, she came in and did her best, and I'm like, really? Really? So somebody must look critically as to why women die. And by the way, this is not gospel truth. This is just what I think. Do we actually resuscitate those women well? Dr. Beza kept saying something about bleeding and the woman dies 24 hours later. Why did she die? What happened? Yet she reached the hospital alive, six hours, 24 hours, 72 hours, why did she die? So, resuscitation. So, what do we know? What we know is PPH is the biggest killer following childbirth. If you control hemorrhage early, you likely save the life, if you control hemorrhage. If you resuscitate in an orderly fashion, it's likely going to be a better outcome, okay? If you give appropriate fluids in a timely fashion, you likely save the life, including blood. Then of course, heterotonics. Now we have many, miso, oxytocin, cabetocin, those things may save a life. Then 
but food for thought. Since I'm also a teacher, I'm not an expert on PPH, but I do a lot of bleeding things because I treat cancers. What is the average blood load, average blood flow to the uterus in a nine months old pregnancy? Do you know? You know why we say, please be there, please do things quickly, please do. Who knows how much blood flows through the uterus in one minute at nine months, average. The, the average, if you do most studies, are about 700 mils a minute. So in one minute, you have 700 mils of blood flowing through that bed. So it means if you cannot control the bleeding, and she's bleeding maximally, she's losing about 700 per minute maximum without controlling it. It means in about four or five minutes, she will be empty. Because she has about, I think, four or five liters of blood, she will be empty. So that's why time is important. When the PPH, when they ring the bell, run. When just come walking because I'm the senior, I have the knowledge, the woman will die. They kept saying something about bleeding. And sometimes we come and we find the woman not bleeding, not because you've controlled the bleeding. The blood is finished. But she's talking to you. And so you're like, ah, things are okay. Do we understand the tools of our trade? During, during an audit, somebody asked a question, what was the color of catheter? And people were saying, but she had three catheters. What cannula, sorry. She had three, I'm like, oh. people understand what the cannula can save your life sometimes, if used well. Midwives, when you tell them put oxytocin, they like bringing those funny blue, I think blue, because it's easy to put. But you're giving oxytocin, which is known to cause uterine exhaustion. Exhaustion of the muscle causes atony. So when problems happen, of course, you've set the stage for failure. Okay. So there are different canola sizes. And uh, I've told you at maximal loss, somebody may be losing 700 mils of blood a minute. Okay. Now, when they are losing, that much, how much are you replacing? So if I use, I think we have gray cannulas, eh? I see them in many words, uh, but the most commonly used are either the pink or the blue, when you go to actual ground. Green, green is now going on so well. Okay, but when I visit facilities, I normally find the pink or the blue for some reason. So what, this, what, the, what the gray means is that if you open this giving set fully, you're putting in 180 mils every minute. And I like nursing because of this reason. Nurses' diagnosis is very nice too, and you can save patients. Now, I'm losing 700, and you have a great, one gray cannula, you're putting in 180. What is happening? There is a deficit, okay? Of almost, I think, 500, 500 plus mils. So unless I'm controlling the bleeding, I am creating a deficit. So in one minute, I'll have a deficit of 500. In two minutes, if I don't control the bleeding, what will be my deficit? 1,000. It's just doubling, doubling. Yeah. In three minutes, if I don't settle my deficit, I am 1,500 liters. So women don't die by mistake. They die because of certain... Fun so you need to put at least two cannulas. That's why they say put at least two large bore. That's almost 400 mils a minute. Assuming you're so controlling the what? You're doing the compression, the oxytocin is going in and you know, you're putting your tampon and all those things. But you may be doing what you think is right, putting in fluids, but never, cre never, never sorting out the deficit. Deficit keeps increasing. That's why the women die. They're always in a deficit. Then of course they will get acidosis, then they will get, I don't know what else, they will get kidney failure and other things because of, so the tools of our trade are also equally important. When they say put too large bore, put too large bore. If you have skills for central lines, put central lines and as you control the bleeding. But sometimes don't also overdo it because you may also cause what they spoke about dilution. And the patient may also get into your things. So there is a balance there. 
So a small bore cannula, you have a full tank and it is leaking excessively, but you're putting a drop, the tank will become empty anyway. So you must be replacing the large bore as much as you losing, but make sure you plug the hole down there. Okay, so PPH is about time management and it's about replacement. Never allow a woman to get into an unmanageable deficit. She may talk to you, but she's in a deficit. And you're saying, but she died talking. There was no bleeding. She's in a deficit from the time she comes in. And by the time she's referred to you, I don't know from Kasese to now, Bohinga. Of course, deficit becomes bigger. That's why certain things are important, like balloons, the compression, and other things. So just think about it. I am not the expert there, but I'm drawing from my experiences of managing cancer patients. You're cutting blood. You must be able to replace the deficit. Uh, I think the IT person can help me out here. So what is the single, what are the best measures to help you determine your deficits? What do you use to determine deficits? Because as they said before, measuring blood loss is almost impossible. Especially in our setting here. By the time we come, things have happened and you come and say, uh, this shit is full of blood. And you're like, ah, that's a thousand, but it's about 4,000. So what are the best measures to help you determine if the deficit has occurred. And this is some of the things which end up killing the women. Did making the decision to move to theater. When do you make it? When do you move? She's not bleeding, but she's in a deficit. What do I do? So I'll just share a piece of guideline we used for research at some point. And uh, So one of the things that Dr. Beza spoke about was monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. Monitoring is, the, monitoring is the one thing we can all do the same way. You know that. You can all take a blood pressure, not so. Whether it is this Dr. Beza doing the blood pressure, whether it is myself, whether it is the midwife, we can all do a blood pressure. And it can give us a clue about the deficit, okay? We can all take a pulse. At least we can all take a pulse, I'm very sure. Okay, so those two things of monitoring should help you, you can expand. So there is something WHO said, uh, shock, I think it's called shock, yeah, shock. And uh, one of the things that we normally use there is blood pressure to determine when we can go to the next step. So sometimes we find a facility, you're doing an audit, Man, we gave oxytocin, then we gave misoprostol, then we gave carbetos, then carboprost, then we... And the woman is bleeding. But nobody took a blood pressure. No one took a pulse. But as I said, when, you, when they call for a team, PPH is not a game for heroes. It's a game for teams. Okay? It's a game for teams. Even the nursing aid may help you. As long as you give clear instructions. Most times when they call even the consultants, PPH, you also come running, hey, she's bleeding. You also go into the valve and start doing compressing. Instead of looking at the whole picture to see what's happening, you take the blood pressure. You take off blood to the lab. Don't come back without blood. You monitor the fluids. Every five minutes, tell me the blood pressure. You know, it's a team sport. So blood pressure, if there is mild PPH, normally the BP will remain normal, usually we we'll do within normal. But if things are getting worse, the deficit is increasing that side where you see the red. The target is, if it is mild and you're estimating less than a thousand mils, never allow the woman to go into, mod, in, in, into the, in the other one, the moderate one. Make sure she does not bleed excessively to get problems on the other side of shock. That's why there's a red line there. So it means, where I used to work those days, those days, as soon as somebody just mentioned the blood pressure is the, the historic pressure is 100, you're in theater. You're in theater. 
whether, whether the bleeding is little, you're there. We shall sort things from there. Because we know we can do a bead inch, we know we can do a tamponade, we can, all those things can be done. So that red zone, remember everything they're saying down there, they're saying they're targets to avoid blood loss reaching. In the shortest time possible, using the most available means to you. If you have a tamponade, put it there. If you can do compression, do it continuously. Make sure you notify the seniors, obstetricians, even if they're not on the ground. So Dr. Beza, things are bad. These are things happening. The BP is like this, the pulse is this. They can advise you and tell you maybe do ABCD because they may have likely seen things. Once you cross the other side, where the diastolic pressure is now, sorry, diastolic is now going into the 80s, God bless you. Because things can go either way. She will die talking to you. But the pressure was 80, where is this? she's dying. So don't cross that area. That's why time is of importance. Stop bleeding as soon as possible. Don't waste time. And also make sure that you're resuscitating adequately and monitoring especially, because moving to second line determined by your monitoring. She may be talking, she may be still oozing, and you're wasting time. I think it is, I think it, Miso is now working. I think now if we give more oxytocin, it may help. The woman will die on you. So think about it. We're not trained to be heroes. We are trained to be professionals. If you want to be a hero, go to the war front and they will shoot you. But professionals are supposed to save lives, especially health workers. So I'd like to just give food for thought. I had Dr. Sebuko's things, we went from, I think, something to 0.6%, something like that, reduction, and I'm like, oh, was it by mistake? Or was it because of an effort? And I would like to see what was his role in that? What was the role of uh, the MOs in that? What was the role of the midwives in that? In, in bringing that reduction down? Because sometimes it is by mistake. And as I specialize, I learned that a lot of the time, people survive by mistake. Not because you did something right, but because God saved you somewhere. So let us focus on implementing these guidelines. Let us do the right thing as they said. If they say give tranexamic acid immediately, give tranexamic acid immediately. If it is Amstel, give the Amstel. That way we can measure and we can know which step is not working out well and then intervene too. But also remember, you cannot know everything. Even as sometimes we begin, they tell you you're on duty as a consultant, they, even you begin, so sometimes you also need help. So help, help, help. Consult, 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 and refer. Don't be a hero that, ah, I don't know if comes here, I love him of the uterus. So I would like to thank you, Fort Porto. As we've said, AOGU, part of our work is disseminating guidelines. I thank the leadership of the senior consultants, the consultants who make this possible in drafting these guidelines and looking at the evidence. Two, I would like to thank the efforts of the midwives. I think if a midwife is well trained and she knows how to use her tools of trade well, we shall save lives. Even from small things, because I'm a super specialist, I look at small things, cannula, That's my tool of trade. It can make a difference. So let us get trained. Let us support each other. Let us make the referral mechanisms work. Even a call is a referral, but also a call can be an issue of accountability. So thank you very much. I know that Fort Porter will do better. The numbers are showing something good. And I pray that uh, next time we come, we can see more, more of the enrolled midwives as well, yeah? because you must supervise them. Okay, so thank you very much, and uh, I wish you a good day. Thank you very much, President. I never had you telling us to not to buy bread. Now, <coughs> the President has summarized it very well. And for me, I say, no woman should die while doing what? Let it be at the back of our minds. Now, that is our last part of, this, of the presentations. The good thing he came last and he has summarized it well. 
Now we have two activities. But before I see what I'm going to say, we need to disseminate this information to our colleagues who have not been online. We have learned many things today, okay? I don't think there is anybody who came here who does not know how to manage PPH. I think we all know, but we came to improve on our skills and revise. So the reason why we chose you in small numbers, one was uh, logistics, another one was time, could not drain the, uni the units. So now that you came here, help to disseminate this information to the people you left behind, okay? We want to have a group photograph before lunch, shall go down where there is space, and then we have a group photograph. After that, we can do the rest, the logistics and the meals, okay? So I think I should get this opportunity to say bye. So I would like to thank our facilitators who have done the job successfully, the partners who have enabled us to be here plus the ministry. And I'd like to thank you, the participants who have spared the time to come here. I hope it has been beneficial. I'd like to thank our postgraduates you have got a very good opportunity while training to get such. The postgraduates are those two ones, the others have remained behind, you can stand up. These are gynecologists we are training, can stand up, Joanna and who? Uh, those ones we are training them to be specialists. I'd like to welcome the most fresh specialists. The brain is still there with a lot of data. I recognize you, Dr. Irumba. That is the freshest brain we have in, this, in the field. Okay, so I thank you for having come and I wish you the best back home. And let's look, now we have a challenge. I showed you the statistics, we are challenged. The president has told you, don't you see we are challenged? Yeah, yeah the figure should come down other than doing what? Thank you very much. So we can go down for the photograph and I would like to close the meeting before it ends. Thank you.